The Box Trolls. Read by Daniel Alexander Svetlichny. Prologue. Winifred Portly Ryan made a point of taking a very long walk every afternoon down the narrow, steep streets of Cheesebridge. She called it her daily constitutional and claimed it was for her health. But actually, 11-year-old Winnie was bored. School was moderately uninteresting and home was excessively tedious. Winnie, Winnie's father was Cheesebridge's leading citizen which made him excruciatingly dull. And when his mother was obsessed with clothes, clothes and more clothes, an outfit for virtually every hour of the day, and that, of course, was colossally tiresome. And so the daily constitutional was born, and Winnie escaped the monotony for several hours. There was only one problem with this tragedy. The village of Cheesebridge was pretty humdrum itself. In fact, as every man, woman and child knew, there were 364 perfectly normal days in Cheesebridge each and every year. And then there was the Tropshaw Baby Day. Now, that day was anything but dull. Along the narrow sidewalk of Buttery Street, most merchants had some sort of sign or banner counting down to Tropshaw Baby Day. As Winnie strolled past the Wheel of Fortune gift shop, a freshly spruced up flag fluttered in the wind announcing... Only three days to TBD. Three days, Winnie thought. And then the town would come to life. There would be parades, special performers, feasts, bonfires, theatrics, fireworks, raffles, and a gala ball. All to solemnly commemorate the gruesome day almost ten years ago when the little baby Tropshaw disappeared and presumably was killed by creatures that lived underneath Cheesebridge the box trolls. The maze-like streets and alleys, along which sat high, narrow homes and shops, were all closely packed together. Even on a long walk, one can one could get only so far. Good afternoon, Miss Bordley Rinder, called a waiter from the doorway of Chez Fromage, one of the town's fan fancier restaurants. Good morning, Jean-Louise, Winnie replied. Only three days to go. Are you excited? Jean-Louis asked. Wildly excited to say the least, when he called, up, called over her shoulder as she continued to walk. And it was true. When he was excited. But not as much as she had been last year, and again the year before that. Because having living through exactly nine Tropshaw baby days so far, the first two or three were a bit of a blur, she found that some of the thrill had recently gone out of it. Winnie wasn't quite sure why. It seemed to be a combination of things. For starters, Winnie had begun to wonder why a day commemorating a tragic abduction and murder was the subject of celebration. Maybe I'm just strange, Winnie thought, but when I think about the tragic loss of a tiny baby, the first things that come to mind aren't dancing, feasting, parading, souvenir hawking, or general all-out partying. Yes, that was probably part of the problem, Winnie decided. But there was more to it than that. And the older she got, the more she felt it. Winnie wasn't just bored with her life. She was, in fact, aching for some excitement, for something different, for some real-life danger. For as long as Winnie could remember, there had been a curfew in Cheesebridge. After darkness had fallen each night, shops were closed down and people retreated into their homes, where they triple locked their doors and shuttered their windows. The things that had taken the Tropshaw baby, as everyone knew, came out of their death cave only at night to roam the streets in search of fresh victims. And that sounded excessively dangerous, to be sure. 
However, after the chop shop baby, no one else of note had disappeared from Cheesebridge. The man taking credit for that was the creepily repulsive Archibald Snatcher, who patrolled the streets with his team of three red hats, the surname for the red hats they almost never took off. Snatcher said his patrol was so intimidating that the monsters had been forced to hunt in other towns. In short, Snatcher had made commuters out of them. Whenever, whenever they did appear in Cheesebridge, and there were people who claimed to have seen them, the Red Hats pursued them and either exterminated them or drove them back to their death cave. But in almost ten years, you think the monsters would have killed at least one other Cheesebridgian? Winnie mused. Or, I don't know, taken a few bites one out of one. And yet, she could not think of another person who had gone missing. It wasn't that she didn't believe in the monsters, she most certainly did. She had been taught all about them, and about the Tropshaw baby, for years, both at school and at home. Adults didn't make up things like that. No, the monsters were very real. So the only explanation, when he decided, is that Snatcher is right. And whenever the monsters came, come looking for a meal in Cheese Cheesebridge, the Red Hats take care of the situation before any violence could occur. Winnie knew she ought to be thankful for that. S Snatcher certainly made no secret of his belief that every man, woman and child should spend the better part of each day being thankful for the protection and vigilance of Archibald P. Snatcher. But as Winnie's curls bounced past yet another cheese bridge, she knew that all calm and no murder made Cheesebridge a dull town. There had to be more to life than the Cheese Guild and getting cheese or tasting cheese or hearing about cheese. There had to be something beyond the countdown to Tropshaw Baby Day and Winnie's Daily Constitutional. One day when I'm old enough, I'll travel, Winnie told herself. I shall leave Cheesebridge and see the sights, have some adventures, live dangerously. I will be a fearless explorer and battle monsters and save people from awful things, and everyone will love me. And I shall wear the same thing every day, and won't ever have to put on another itchy dress or frilly shirt with puffed sleeves, not for the rest of my life. The thought of it made Winnie feel a little better, but only a little. She knew she was still only a kid. It would be a long time before she was old enough to pack up and begin her travels. But I will do it, she silently promised, because there has to be something else out there, something different, something completely unknown, and I'm going to find it, even if I have to travel halfway across the world. When he tripped over something and almost fell, Dash it all! she exclaimed. In the midst of her daydreaming, she had absentmindedly wandered from the sidewalk and into the street. She looked down and saw she had just caught her foot on the lip of a manhole cover that was ever so slightly dislodged. I must be more careful, she told herself. I don't want to get run over by a truck before I've, before I've so much as gotten a toe near some place other than Cheesebridge. When he stepped back onto the sidewalk and picked up her pace a little. Seconds later, while well, there was a quick clanking noise and the manhole cover suddenly dropped back into place. When he, when he was too far away to hear it or to notice anything out of the ordinary happening where she had just been standing, something had moved it from below. Chapter 1 The world had been divided into above ground and below ground for as long as eggs could remember. It was just a way of things. Above ground, different creatures lived in, lived in wooden things called houses on a hill crowned with wooden things and flat paths. All the wooden things and paths and creatures together were called Cheesebridge. The creatures were called people. People wore flabby bits of, with ruffles and stripes, but box drawers dressed themselves in sturdy boxes. Eggs loved his own box with a picture of an egg on the front. You only needed one good box. Below ground, Eggs lived happily with the other box trolls. Once the cheese people were awake, the box trolls slept. And once the cheese people slept, 
the box shows made their way to the surface and combed the streets and garbage and rubbish bins for junky bits. Anything useful that could be made into a gizmo or a machine or a contraption. The box shows found the most wonderful things above ground. It was amazing to Eggs that any creature with a working brain would want to throw such treasures away. From his cozy ca cavern nook, Eggs could see countless junky bits. Findies and shinies, clunkers, honkers, and spinners. Almost all of them found their way into an invention, or a motor, or a thingamajig. There was nothing Egg's friends couldn't make, or fix, or fudge together. Egg's himself was partial to musical machines. Of course, the entire cavern was, was filled with music of one kind or another. The smooth wah, wah, wah of the water wheel that provided electricity, the clackety clackety squeal of the troll lift that sounded like a soprano w warming up for the opera, and the occasional baritone hum of the conveyor belt that delivered box straw safely home after an evening of junky bits hunting above ground. In the garden, oversized, sweet-tempered sweet fragile was working one side of a seesaw pump, while shrimpy, bossy bucket worked the other. Bucket had a strange box that covered the back and sides of his head, giving him the appearance of a turtle in a coffin. When Bucket and Fragile got the pump working, it made a steady ee ah like an like an overexcited donkey. Water dripped in on into hanging umbrellas, and from there, small drops funneled to the ground, neatly splattering to state to sate thirsty vegetables. Put together. The sounds made a little song that Eggs liked to hum along to. Ee ah, plink plink. Ee ah, plink plink. Ee ah, plink deep plink. Cause flat. Then the whole thing started over again. At the other end of the cave, the conveyor belt began to move. The hundreds of tin cans had acted as rollers, all rattling together. Eggs sat up. Someone was returning home. Eggs never failed to feel a rush of excitement when the box straws came back after a night of junky bits hunting. They sometimes brought extraordinary and fascinating things from above ground. Eggs wished with all his heart that he could go with them. Not a day passed when he didn't hope Fish would place a giant hand on his shoulder and guide him into the sucker harbor with the others. They think I'm too young. They all do, Eggs thought ruefully. And I'm not. Maybe I was for a while. And Shu had given Eggs three pairs of sneakers this year, and they just kept ending up too small. So something was happening. And yet Eggs knew that next to the other box rolls, even little Tim in knickers, he still looked pretty puny. Unlike the others, Eggs's head fur was thick and shiny, not coarse and wiry and in one small tuft as it should have been. For as long as he could remember, Eggs had suffered from a ration of the skin that left him a peculiar shade of pale peach all over, rather than a healthy grey or a robust green. His fingers were not the least bit sausage-like, instead they were alarmingly slender and delicate. To add insult to injury, Eggs had also been born with ears that did not tapper into little points in the regular way. They were round and dainty, like two little seashells. Eggs was particularly sensitive about them. To complete the picture, Eggs had small, unmistakably brown eyes. Though he sometimes imagined they contained a hint of yellow in a certain light, he knew he wasn't kidding himself. And no matter how hard, how hard he tried, he simply could not make his eyes glow golden amber in the dark, when every other box straw in the world was born knowing how to do it. There was no, there was no getting around it. Eggs was the strangest looking box troll in the cave. But strange looking doesn't mean I'm not getting older, Eggs told himself. Now Eggs could hear the swish swish of a box troll careening down the cardboard line chute to the conveyor belt. Maybe it was Fish or Shoe with a new part for his music machine. Fish, drop, Fish dropped onto the conveyor belt and was carried down to the cave floor, where he landed on a pillar with a dignified thunk. Moments later, Shu shot out of the chute and belt and belt disposed of him on the pillow next to Fish. Did you find something for me? X called out excitedly. 
Fish's face lit up at the sound of Vegas' voice, and his smile revealed his perfectly yellow and divinely pointy teeth. He stood up and brushed off his box as he stretched his long legs and scratched his lovely potato-shaped head. Fish was quite tall for a box troll. When Shu stood up glowering next to him, he looked like a hostile toadstool. Fish chattered away in his usual stream of gurgles and rummaged around about in his box as Eggs nodded patiently. Finally, Fish produced a small rounded object and handed it to Eggs. Oh, a rubbery grommet! Eggs exclaimed. This could be just the thing I need for my music machine. Thank you, Fish. Fish burbled something that meant, You're welcome, as Shu began rummaging about in his box. Eggs watched with curiosity and more than a little wistful envy. Shu always found, found good things, but often he liked to hide in anything that gleamed or glittered. If you had a shiny and Shu was around, you had to keep your eye on him. Shinies, and nuts of most varieties, had a way of accidentally sneaking into Shu's box. Soon I will be old enough to go above ground and hunt for junkie bits, Eggs declared. Fish and Shu exchanged a look with twin pairs of unblinking yellow eyes. Well, I will, Eggs repeated more quietly, turning away to retrieve his music machine and work in the addition of the rubbery grommet. Fish stated, and Shu joined in with an enthusiastic, now that you mention it, I am kind of hungry, Eggs agreed. The conveyor belt had started up again, and more box trolls were beginning to arrive. Soon they would all be home. Definitely best to eat early, Eggs thought. In this cave, the early bird really did to get the worm. Eggs followed Fish and Shoe to the Garden of Wrigley Delights. Fragile and Bucket were taking a break from the pump, and were sitting in the grass looking for snacks. The garden's lush and abundant plantings provided for all of the box trolls' nutritional needs. There were juicy pumper worms and tart fatty grubs in the soil, crunchy winger zingers, if you could catch one, zooming from umbrella to umbrella, candy colored scooter beetles lounging under leaves, and gonzillipedes scuttling underfoot. You had to be fast to eat them or they would climb back out of your mouth. Vroom, vroom. Someone yelled, and Eggs jumped to one side as wheels sped by on the unicycle he rode everywhere, serenading himself with a selection of burbled engine noises. Nickers tottered in next, followed by a tall, quiet box troll named Sparky, wearing his customary welding goggles. Nickers' small size and wide-set, anxious expression made him look like a nervously dazed piglet. Eggs held out the rubbery grommet, and Sparky flipped up his goggles to examine it. He made a of delight and nodded approvingly. Nickers shifted from foot to foot nervously, breathing loudly through his mouth. Wanna see it, Nickers? Eggs asked, holding out the grommet. Nickers shrieked and jumped back as if Eggs had threatened him with a freshly sharpened axe. Fish, fish, fish said, patting a nice mound of earth. Egg smiled. He could always count on fish to save him the best seat. Fish rooted around about in the, in the soot with his claw-like nails, unearthing a pale pink bumper worm that wriggled in protest. With his other hand, Fish produced a nut from an, earth, from an earthen hole and placed it on the ground, beaming at eggs from ear to ear. Shu appeared out of nowhere tapping the back of Fish's arm and then reaching for the nut when Fish turned his head. Brrr, bra, bra Fish yelled, slapping Shu's head away, hand away. Fish picked up the worm and tied it neatly around the nut, then handled the undulating delicacy to Eggs. Gruel, the fish said, fish said, nodding approvingly as Eggs popped the whole concoction into his mouth. Shu ambled away, making muttering sounds under his breath. <laughs> Wheels shouted excitedly, holding a huge gazillipede by a few hundred of its legs. He waved triumphantly at eggs, then leaned his head back and carefully lowered the insect down his throat in the manner of a sword swallower. 
by the pump, Eggs could hear Sparky and Nickers having some kind of dispute over a winger zinger. They stood facing each other, each holding one of the zinger's wings. Sparky's usually expressionless face was pinched, as if he might cry, but he let loose a massive sneeze instead, giving poor Nickers such a fright that he dove into his own box for cover. When Sparky saw that, saw that Eggs was watching, he winked, held up the zinger by one wing, and popped it into his mouth, chewing it with great relish. Egg smiled back, looking around as other box trolls came in to dine. Books was over by the shrubs, doing a little digging. When he stood up, he handed two butters soft fatty grubs to Old Sweets, who popped out his false teeth and bobbed his head in gratitude. Only after Sweets had eaten both of the fatty grubs did Books sit down to eat, to eat his own dinner, a handful of scoocher beetles which he consumed while slipping through a tattered copy of For Whom the Box Trolls. Shu reappeared, plopping down next to eggs and dumping a handful of nuts and several bottle caps on the ground. He tossed a nut into his mouth and, wagged, and, waggled, and waggled his eyebrows at eggs, who laughed. How did you find all those nuts so fast? Eggs asked. Did you swipe them from somebody? Shu did his best to look morally outraged at the suggestion of theft as he put a second nut in his mouth, holding one in each cheek like a chipmunk with hoarding issues. I meant what I said before, you know, Egg said, looking from, Shu, f looking from Shu to fish. I will be old enough soon to go above ground to hunt for junkie bits. I'm probably already old enough. Fish and Shu exchanged a brief look. Egg sighed. Fish and Shu were probably thinking about what had happened the first and only time Eggs had ventured above ground. Eggs thought about it too. In fact, he thought about it a great deal. He hadn't really gone above ground. Not technically, because his, his feet had stayed underground the entire time. But Eggs' whole head, including his eyes, had been above ground, and the manhole cover had been pushed aside just enough to give him a very good view of the street. Eggs did not like what he saw that day, and he most definitely did not like what he had heard. He ran the whole miserable scene through his head again. First, there was a voice that sounded like it was coming out of some different kind of music machine, perhaps one that had a few too many rubbery grommets. Hear ye! Hear ye! Hear ye! The voice bellowed. And Eggs put his hands over his ears, which were small and delicate and accustomed to gentle box straw burbles and gurgles. Take heed! Take heed! The voice continued. All must be off the streets! The curfew is now in force! The day is done! The night is nigh! All off the streets, cheese bridgians! That sounded pretty peculiar to Eggs. Why leave the streets at night? That was the time when all the best things happened. Dark was the time for junkie bins hunting. The night was filled with gears and springs and widgets just waiting to be found by a box troll, so they could be made into something marvellous for the cavern. Why would the cheese bits want to clear the street? X felt the cobblestones around the manhole vibrate slightly, and he heard the unmistakable hum of an engine. Box trolls knew engines, any kind, all kinds. The voice blared again, louder this time. Good citizens of Cheesebridge, do not be caught out in the dark with the horrid monsters roam. Now is not the time for bravery or foolishness. Leave that to us. Monsters? Roaming the Cheesebits streets? Eggs blinked in surprise. This was certainly the first he'd ever heard of it. The hum and growl grew louder, and Eggs drew slightly back as a funny boxy thing on wheels rattled into view, a lumpy load of furniture and bags mounted precariously on the roof. Two sinister-looking creatures of differing shapes and sizes, wearing stovepipe hats of blood red, clung to the side of the vehicle. One of them was gigantic a bald-headed creature almost spilling out of his clothes, his red hat freakishly tiny on his colossal and, s and slightly misshapen head. 
The second man was long and lean, like a bit of taffy that had been pulled from end from end. His head seemed too small for the rest of them, save for his oversized ears, which stuck out at such odd angle it seemed they were trying to escape. And now, Eggs realized that what he had mistaken for a lumpy load strapped onto the roof was actually another red hat, clutching one arm of the chair and pursing his lips as he looked about. As he looked about. Those must be some of the cheese bit creatures, Eggs thought. Aren't they just awful looking? Exceptionally ugly. Some of them look like overgrown fatty grubs. Little wonder his friends had always tried to keep him from seeing them. But Eggs was getting older now. Not all box rolls were big and strong. Sweet little oil can, who had always had a doll dollop of oil at the ready of, of any gizmo that needed it, was quite small, and the high-strung knickers wasn't much bigger. No, Eggs really believed he was ready for this sort of bis sort of thing now, even if the cheese bits were an ugly bit of business. The, bo the boxy vehicle was passing by now, just yards from where Eggs peered wide-eyed in his hiding place. Now Eggs see could see there were letters painted on the side. Books had gone to a great deal of trouble to teach Eggs his letters, and Eggs had done his best to pay attention, though the whole thing seemed rather pointless. But now, he tried to make out what the words on the boxy thing said. b a z t a r a o s b a z t r o s Eggs worked the sounds around his mouth. Box trolls! He exclaimed triumphantly. Boy, wouldn't books be impressed when Eggs told him about reading that? The second word provided, pr proved a little more challenging. Egg. He said, Eggs, that's me! Eggs. T. Uh. My. Not. Eggs. Wait. Eggs knew this word. Because it was written on the side of a big of a big plastic jug he had once tried to incorporate into his music machine, along with the drawing of a big dead bug. Exterminator. Box troll. Exterminators. Eggs didn't get the chance to savor his triumph of phonics because the meaning suddenly became clear to him. Box troll exterminators. The cheese bits exterminate us. As the boxy thing neared, X could see its driver. His lips were, pearl, were pulled back in a snarl, his buggy eyes huge behind a pair of round spectacles. Perched atop his egg-shaped head was a tattered red hat that was every bit as twisted and grizzled as his face. As if some silent signal had been given, the red hat's head snapped to the left, his cold eyes fixed directly on Egg's. The man looked as if he might eat eggs for breakfast and not think anything of it. Egg smacked one small hand over his mouth in horror. Why would the red-headed cheese bits hunt box trolls? That certainly wasn't very neighborly of them. As the vehicle slowly pulled away, Eggs realized the voice he'd heard belonged to the, reptil the reptilian-looking red hat sitting on top. He held a funnel-shaped device to his mouth as he spoke. Lock your doors! Build your windows! The red, hat, the, red cat, the red hat called. Fathers, hide your mechanicals! Mothers, hug your children! Keep them safe from the vicious beasts of the night! Vicious beasts? Eggs wondered. I suppose he means me, and fish, and shoe, and everyone. How rude! A small cheese bit began to run alongside the truck. How many monsters will you catch tonight, Mr. Snatcher? The little bit shouted. Child! Do you want to end up like the Chop Shop Baby? Snatched away in the deadly shadows? Eaten alive in the underground cave? Your poor father searching for you into the night? The man yelled. The small cheese bits came to an abrupt stop. No one wants to end up like the Chop Shop Baby, the boy mumbled looking nervously about as the boxy vehicle drove away, the one called Snatcher still droning his warnings. When the street was clear at last, X pulled the manhole cover back into place 
and scurry down to the safety of the Boxhall cabin. When the other Boxhalls returned later, Sweet Little Oil Can was not with them. Boxhalls did go away sometimes. Ace had known that. But he had always thought they had just decided to move somewhere else. But the day Eggs peaked above ground was the day he realized that when the Boxhalls went hunting junkie bits, something else went, went hunting them. And they didn't always come back. He hadn't been above ground since. All the fun had been taken out of it. Nevertheless, Egg knew, Egg's news knew in his heart he was getting to be the age when he ought to be joining his fellow box straws on the nightly junkie bids hunt. I want to help gather gizmos and find these for the cavern, Egg thought. I won't let any grubby cheese bit exterminate me. Fish and Shoe were burbling quietly to each other, but fell silent when they saw Eggs watching them. Egg suddenly got the idea, but maybe they had been talking about him. Look, I mean it. I am ready to start going above ground with the rest of you, Egg said loudly. Shu fidgeted inside his box. His head disappeared for a moment, then reappeared. He waddled over, over to Eggs and handed him something, then walked away before Eggs had a chance to say something, to say anything. Eggs unwrapped the object Shu had handed him. It was a pair of new shoes. They were yellow and had teddy bears drawn on them. Eggs sighed. But they're wrong about me, X told himself. Just because I happen to have a few physical flaws through absolutely no fault of my own doesn't mean I can't hold my own above ground. In the center of the cavern, the box trolls had begun the process of stacking themselves one on top of, the, of another in the traditional box troll sleeping pile. Egg stifled a yawn. He wanted to give a speech right then and make everyone take notice. Fish, shoe, books, bucket, all of them. They would all hear him standing up for himself and be impressed with his moxie. They would agree it was time for Eggs to join the pack. But it was getting early, and the sleeping pile looking, looked tantalizing indeed. That's all right. I'll go to sleep now like everyone else, X thought. He adjusted his box then began to climb to the top of the sleeping pile. He kept his head down so the other box trolls wouldn't notice the big smile on his face. They would just think that was weird, too. But it didn't matter. Come the next night, Eggs would take his rightful place above ground, shoulder to shoulder with his fellow box trolls. Chapter 2 In the end, for reasons Eggs could not figure out, the box trolls relented the following night, as if his first trip above ground had been on the calendar for months. X was gearing up to give his nightly speech when Fish appeared silently at his side. He gave Eggs a long hug, practically flattening his box in the process, then handed him a gizmo that looked like a helmet with shiny bits. Eggs put it on. It was a cab fashioned out of leather, and what Eggs thought were windows on top, until Fish flipped them down over Eggs' eyes and switched them on. The gathered box trolls burbled and drummed their boxes with approval as Eggs grinned from ear to ear. His funny eyes may, might not glow yellow in the dark, but with this gizmo, Eggs would be able to do anything the other box trolls could. Fish gave him a gentle push to the succapper which whisk, whisked box trolls from the cavern toward the surface. Too surprised to say anything, and afraid Fish would change his mind, Egg stepped under the succapa and scrunched his face at the powerful sensation of indrawn air that gulped up, upward as if he were a bit of lemonade in a straw. It made his insides feel squishy and his ears all tickly, but Eggs didn't care. He was above ground! He waited, humming with excitement, as the box trolls burbled. Nickers, Cox, and Sparky were going to investigate some sort of alley, from what Eggs could gather. Eggs was to go with fish, shoe, and wheels toward a wooden house surrounded by shrubs and garden ornaments. Every window blazed with light. Fish showed Eggs how to walk quietly, keeping his head low. He made him practice emergency boxing a few times, 
You had to drop to the ground and pull your legs, arms and head inside your box. Then, to any passing eye, you were just an old bit of cardboard. X's box was even smaller than it had been last month, but he finally executed an emergency boxing that passed for Fish's inspection. Fish led Eggs toward the house, one huge hand gently but firmly gripping Eggs's box. There were several large round cans in front of the house. Shoe and Wheels had already reached one of them and were digging through it, their yellow eyes gleaming brightly. Fish was standing beneath the window. He pointed at his own head, then dropped into his box. Eggs climbed on top of him and peered through the window at... Eggs had no idea what he was looking at. It appeared to be a massive dish of strawberry ice cream in a colossal white ceramic bowl, but strawberry ice cream do not usually shriek. And this one was shrieking up a storm. Ah! Howled the ice cream as it began to quiver and flick off gobs of frothy whipped cream stuff. It's a big cheese bit, Eggs hissed. Fish stood up and neatly tossed Eggs into the grass. They both emergency boxed themselves. Something was looking in my window! The cheese bit in the ceramic bowl shrieked. Something! Because Eggs was really too large to fit entirely in his box, his head was sticking out. He caught sight of something in the driveway. If that's what I think it is, we could really use one, Eggs thought. He crept toward it. He was right. It was a wheelbarrow. Fellas, over here, Eggs whispered. Wheels got there first. He lifted the wheelbarrows, his handles, and kicked the tire and gave a wild gurgle of approval. Fish gave the signal for them to retreat with their prize and make for the nearest manhole. As they raced down the street, Eggs could hardly contain his own pride. His first junkie bit! And it wasn't just any junkie bit, it was a wheelbarrow! It was a finesy even the most grizzled and experienced box troll would have been proud of. There's a manhole! Eggs called, urging them on. Shu was in the lead. Fish was making sure Eggs kept up in the middle, and Wheels was moving a little slower, bringing up the rear. A loud sudden whoomp brought them up short. Fish shoved Eggs toward an old barrel, and Eggs dove into it. For a moment, Eggs heard nothing at all. Very cautiously, making sure his eye beams were switched off, he peeked over the top of the barrel. At first, he did not realize what he was seeing. Wills was there, lying down in the street, struggling like he was trying to remove a heavy blanket. Maybe I could get that thing off him, X thought, standing up so he could climb out of the barrel. Then he heard footsteps, and he dropped to the bottom of the barrel in a crouch. Outside, he heard a familiar voice. Gentlemen, do you smell... What I smell. It's the voice of the terrible red-headed cheese bit, Eggs thought. The one called Snatcher. The one with the truck that says, Box Troll Exterminator. Oh no, whispered Eggs. Poor Wheels. Very carefully, Eggs peered over the top of the barrel. He pressed his hand over his mouth to cover his groan of dismay. Eggs had seen these cheese bits before. They were burned into his memory. A huge, menacing silhouette of a man wearing an enormous stovepipe hat loomed into view. Snatcher! And in the street, climbing out of the boxy red vehicle were the other three red hats Eggs had seen the day he had peeked above ground. Smell? asked the gangly tall red hat. You heard me, Mr. Pickles, Snatcher snapped. That, my friends, is the rotten stench of fear. As you can see, Mr. Gristle has already captured one of them with the net gun. Mr. Trout, take care of it. Eggs gripped the sides of the barrel. 
his eyes huge. He didn't want to watch. He didn't want to see any of this, but he couldn't look away. The boulder-sized red hat called Trout bent over the squirming and struggling wheels, who was still trapped in the net, and lifted him, net and all, in his arms. Into the truck with it, Buck Pickles cried, doing some sort of victory dance by springing from one long skinny leg, skinny leg to the other. Another villain off the streets! And where's our reward? The reward of a thing well done, Trout recited, tossing wheels into the truck and slamming the door. Is having done it. Pickles's face fell. I meant like a big trophy, Pickles said. Don't you think, Russell? Quiet. I'm trying to smell the fear, barked the waddling Gristle. Fear, he repeated in a low, villainous voice. Eggs dropped lower in the barrel as Pickles and Gristle began rooting through a pile of old boxes on the street. Of Snatcher's three red-hat minions, Eggs got the idea that Gristle, with his dead eyes and his permanent sneering snarl, was definitely the scariest. They're searching for more of us. X thought in horror. His head, his heart began to hammer in his chest. Was he going to be captured his very first night hunting? Fish would be beside himself with worry. You ever smell fear, Mr. Trout? asked Pickles. Oh, I believe the boss was speaking symbolical, Mr. Pickles, said Trout, glancing nervously at Snatcher before kicking an empty box to one side. Me? I smell the fair at once. Big fella, too. Stuck in the chimney, he was, Pickles declared. No, no, it was a metaphor. You can't smell a metaphor. You know, like how Macbeth called fear a dagger of the mine, and, and for... That's right, the ferret screamed all night, Pickles interrupted. So I suppose I heard fear, but nope, I never smelled it. Criminy, didn't you hear what I said? You're as dumb as was one of these boxes, Pickles. You really are. Trout muttered as he kicked another box, which flew in the air and landed at Pickles' feet. A squeak erupted from inside. Oh no, Eggs thought. Don't let them have found someone else. Got one, Pickles yelled, pulling out a squirming box troll. Eggs put his hand over his eyes. He couldn't bear to see who it was. It was all just too awful. Come on, you squirmy monster. Your days of evil doing have just come to an end. Pickles' voice continued. What, you really think box trolls understand the duality of good and evil? Trout asked. Eggs heard the truck door open, then slam. They must, right? I mean, why else would they hide from us? We are the good guys. No, you aren't, muttered Eggs. Cheese bits are monsters. Yeah, I suppose we are the good guys, Trout said. Find any more? Eggs heard the sound of another box being kicked. He winced. There! There! Snatcher bellowed. Two more! Quickly, Mr. Gristle! Acquire them! Two more? Eggs decided to take a chance and peek out of the barrel again. His stomach lurched. It was fish and shoe! And they realized they've been seen! As, egg as Eggs watched helplessly, the two box shores made a break for it, dashing across the street and vaulting over a fence that led to a small alley. Acquire! bellowed Gristle, following them across the street. I'm gonna smash them with my bat! The alley fence did not slow Gristle down. He simply ran right through it, bits of wood and hinges raining down onto the cobblestones. In his barrel, Eggs dropped into a crouch in a terrified, shaking ball with his arms over his head. What would happen if they got fish? How could Egg survive without him? Boom! yelled Gristel, swinging his bat wildly. Eggs flinched as he heard it connect with wood and brick. What? Where did they go? Gristel bellowed. Acquire! Eggs heard heavy footsteps stampeding down the alley. After a moment, Pickles and Trout scampered after him. Follow Gristle, you two idiots, muttered Snatcher. More footsteps. Then Eggs heard the sound of an engine being started. 
Snatcher was driving away. Slowly, Eggs tried to stand up. His legs were shaking so badly, he had to grab the sides of the barrel to pull himself to his feet. The street was empty. Cautiously, still feeling as if he might be sick, Eggs emerged from the barrel. He crossed the street and peered down the alley. There was nothing there but an old broken street cart. But what do I do? Where do I go? Eggs wondered, biting his lips to stop himself from crying. He took a few shaky steps toward the street he thought might lead to a manhole. To his utter alarm, the old street cart began to follow him. Eggs froze in his tracks. Was this a red hat trick to bait and capture him? The street cart tilted one way, then the other, then toppled to the ground with a crash. Two large pieces of it seemed to suddenly grow arms, legs, and heads. Fish! Shoo! Eggs cried, almost hysterical with relief. He rushed towards his friends, then looked up and down the street. They got wheels! They got wheels! Eggs whispered. And I think they got someone else too, but I didn't see who. Even as he said it, Eggs found it hard to believe. Red Hats had snatched wheels right in front of his eyes. For the first time, Eggs fully understood the horror of facing the box trolls. The danger that faced them every night when they hunted, and diminished their numbers slowly and steadily. Until what? Eggs thought miserably. Until every last one of us is gone? Fish gave Eggs a little shake, to snap him out of his fear. He firmly gripped Eggs' hand, and the three of them raced across the street and down the sidewalk. The wheelbarrow was still there, lying on his side next to the manhole cover. Shu yanked open the manhole, and before Eggs could protest that the wheelbarrow should go first, Fish gave him a shove. For months, Eggs had imagined what it would feel like to whiz down the series of tunnels and drop through the chute into onto the conveyor belt. But now Eggs barely noticed or cared. Everything was a blur until he shot out of the chute spout, bumping down the conveyor belt and landed on the big pillow on the cavern floor. X stood up, adjusted his box, and let his eyes adapt to the light. Usually, the sight of the cavern was the most beautiful thing in the world to him. He would never get enough of the mass, w mass of workshops and interconnected machines. The water wheel fashioned from junky bits, the giant chandelier sun of hundreds of old bulbs wired together, and the constellation of lights and symphony of sounds that flickered and buzzed like an amusement park. But now he felt nothing. He was numb. Something on the belt was making a clattering noise, and the wheelbarrow came flying off and landed upside down. Fish came zooming down behind it, followed by Shu. Fish picked up the wheelbarrow and set it on its side. He gave the wheel a spin with his claw and nodded. Shu quietly smacked his box, then smacked Eggs' box too. That's it? Eggs is asked. We just go on like nothing had happened. Shu made an un unintelligible noise and walked away, pushing the wheelbarrow. Fish hesitated, looking deep into Eggs' eyes. Eggs had never seen such enormous sadness on his friend's face. Eggs looked down, embarrassed. Of course they were not acting as if nothing happened. They would each grieve in their own way. But not while there were there was work to be done in the cavern. And always it seemed there was more work than they could handle. I know, Egg said. That wheelbarrow could fix the problem with the water wheel. Work has to go on. I've never seen this many bulbs dark in our sun. I remember when I couldn't look straight at it without seeing spots. And when did the clock stop chiming? Fish! Things are breaking faster than we can find junky bits to fix them. And now I think I know why. There aren't many box straws left. Fish stared at eggs with unblinking yellow lemon, lemon eyes. The sadness had left his face. Now Fish simply looked determined. Things aren't ever going to be the same, are they? Eggs asked. 
The Red Hats have taken too many of us. This is it, right? Just tell me, Fish. I just want to know. The end is nigh, isn't it? This is the Box Troll Apocalypse. Fish gave Eggs a short, excruciatingly tight hug, his claws making a scrabbity scrabble sound as they scrapped out over Eggs' box. Then he waddled away to catch up with Shu. Fine, then, Eggs said as loudly as he could. I'll just go to my nook and work at my music machine. Play a tune, maybe. Not that there's going to be any dancing tonight, Eggs thought glumly. Egg sighed, then headed for the carousel troll lift chairs. He had to let several go by before he found one with an, unbro with an unbroken seat. The troll lift squeaked and shuddered and clickety clacked its way up to the cavern wall. Egg steadied himself, then jumped off onto a familiar ledge carved into the rock, its surface smooth and shiny from centuries of box troll feet. A little quattro sabatinos would be comforting, Egg said to himself. I still say this is the best album they ever put out. The cardboard cover to the old record had faded and suffered from the handling of too many box troll claws, but the colour photograph of the sabatinos in question was still visible. Egg stared at it as he had so often before, regarding the four creatures resembled cheese bits only in their general size and colouring. Eggs usually could never get enough of the elaborate swell of fur each Sabatino had under his nose, of the magnificent striped outer garments where a box would normally be worn, of the marvellous vanilla-coloured flattish discs they each wore on their heads, in the same way the cheese bits wore their red hats. Eggs slid the flat vinyl disc from the cardboard cover and placed it carefully on his music machine's turntable. When he flickered, when he flicked the switch to the on position, the turntable began making a high-pitched squeak with each rotation. Bother. That won't do, Eggs muttered. He turned so he was facing the cavern and shouted, Hey, oil can, can you... Eggs' voice faded. He remembered that oil can had been gone a long time, and now there was no wheels either and he still didn't know who else the Red Hats had captured tonight. He didn't want to know. Eggs sat on the ground, pulled his knees to his chest, and very quietly began to cry. Chapter 3 Winnie placed a pair of cheddar orange earmuffs on her head and pressed down tight. It was no good. She could still hear the bellowing, thunderous voices of her father and his guests downstairs. The tasting room had a strong, stout wooden door, and Winnie's bedroom was clear at the other end of the Cheese Guild, one of the largest and grandest buildings in all of Cheesebridge. But it made no difference. They could probably be heard in outer space once they started going on about cheese. It's all they ever seemed to want to discuss. Cheese, cheese, cheese. Ah, oh, it's so grating, Winnie muttered, throwing the earmuffs down in disgust. Looks like it's another night holed up in my room alone, she thought ruefully. I'm the most miserable girl in Cheesebridge. She flopped down on her soft bed, smacking away the ruffle-edged pillows that covered it. Lying on her stomach, propped up on her elbows, Winnie leafed through the latest issue of Citizen Cheesebridge magazine. There was a gory article with pictures about the Chopshaw baby. They ran the same thing every year before the, an before the anniversary, but Winnie couldn't help scanning the illustrations of the crime scene and reading the lurid interviews with experts offering theories as to exactly what had happened to that baby. A shudder rippled up Win Winnie's spine. Pure evil. You'd have to be, to boil a baby alive, Winnie murmured, feeling her arms erupt in goosebumps. And only pure evil would have the stomach to eat someone's eyeballs and make soup of their innards. Winnie turned the page. Local experts say no one is safe, read the, read the headline. 
The experts, someone named Mr. A. Resnatch, had a very convincing theory that the abduction and gruesome murder of the Tropshaw baby had been simply a test run to begin a long-term study of the highly efficient Red Hat protection team. He said the fiendish monsters known as Box Trolls were now ready to unleash a secret weapon to battle the Red Hats while the Box Trolls went after the citizens of Cheesebridge. Resnatch noted that children of all ages were especially vulnerable. When he began reading out loud, <clears throat> Resnatch told this reporter, No one is safe. There are monsters out there, and they want to chew your limbs off and roast your skull in a cauldron and bake your fingers in lightly salted cornmeal breading. So far, the valiant efforts of Archibald Snatcher and his crack team of Red Hats have kept Cheesebridge safe. But an evil plot is unfolding. The time will be soon, and the streets will run with blood. Winnie pressed her hand to her heart. My word! she exclaimed. Then she continued to read. When this reporter pressed Resnatch to give a more specific idea of when the bloodbath would resume, his only response was to ask, what is the bloodiest, most somber, most gruesome day of the year? Chopshaw Baby Day, of course. Tomorrow. Winnie pushed the magazine under a blanket and lay back on the pillows, her eyes wide. Perhaps Resnatch is right, Winnie thought. Perhaps the Boxtrol monsters were just getting started with the Chopshaw Baby. Perhaps they really had been building a secret weapon all this time so they could start feasting on Cheesebridgeians again. Perhaps, when he told himself, they are already here. Suddenly, when he sat bolt upright in bed, clutching her hands to the neck of her nightgown. At the window, just by her bed, outside the window, to be precise, something had moved. When he was sure of it, she sat frozen, staring straight ahead, afraid to budge. It was after dark well after curfew. Anyone in Cheesebridge who had any business going anywhere was already downstairs in the tasting room with her father. Could it have been one of the... When he dared not even finish the thought. Moving with greatly exaggerated casualness, she stretched and pretended to struggle through a galaxy-sized yawn. Slowly, arms still overhead in a boy and just tuck it out stretch she maneuvered herself closer to the window when she could take the suspense no longer she dropped her arms and pressed her face right up against the glass monsters when he shrieked at the top of her lungs then she smacked her hand over her mouth to stifle her gasp she dove face first back onto the bed and pulled a pillow over her head could Mr. A. Resnatch have hit, the, have hit the nail on the head? Were they ready for this? Like all children, Winnie had to participate in occasional after-school box troll buster programs, learning what to look for outside your window in the morning to see if they've been watching you, what sorts of sounds to listen for, the importance of observing the strict curfew laws. But for all her careful attention, Winnie had only thought one perhaps two times before that she might have glimpsed a bit of something, a strange, what's it, gone in the blink of an eye, that might possibly have been monster-related. But she had never heard a sound right under her window. She had never seen a shadow that had never been there before. And they did say in Boxtrol Busters that the monsters liked to cluster under windows at night and spy on their prey. Maybe just one more little peek. Winnie got up and pressed her face to the glass again. She scanned Market Square below, which was covered in a layer of heavy fog. For a moment, the moon emerged from behind the cloud, shining directly through the fog. Perhaps I've been cooped up in here too long, Winnie muttered. I guess my eyes were just playing tricks on me. There's nothing there but a couple of old boxes. Then Winnie gasped and drew back. The monster, the boxes seemed to shift and change position, but that was not what startled her. 
What she saw was a beam of moonlight highlighting something coming out of one of the boxes. A pale, ghostly face, the color of Swiss cheese, with large eyes that seemed to be looking right at her, and a mouth that dropped into an O when it saw, right, saw her right, looking right back. It is monsters! Winnie cried, reaching up and yanking the curtains shut. Oh, why, why had she taken that second look? They might have seen me, she whispered. They could be coming for me right now. They could be on their way to the cheese hill to catch me and eat my eyeballs. I was one father. Winnie leapt off, leapt off the bed and grabbed her bathrobe, still giddy from the shock and trying very hard to feel the complete and utter terror of a girl who was very likely about to be torn limb from limb and consumed alive in small fanged bites. My goodness, this is so exciting, Winnie said throwing open her bedroom door and racing through the hallway and down the white set of stairs. The sound of voices and laughter grew much louder as Winnie scampered toward a heavy set of double wooden doors marked by an enormous brass plate engraved with the words White Hat Members Only. Winnie pounded on the door as hard as she could. She knew Father would be vexed if she entered the tasting room without permission, especially during one of his meetings but the voices kept right on inside as if they haven't listened to her. Winnie heard her father's voice temporarily rise above the others. Settle down, men, settle down. Important town business to discuss, yes? First on the docket. We have more complaints about crumbling bridges. A braying voice interrupted. S talking of crumbling, is that a new blue cheese I see there, Lord Portly Ryan? A chorus of voices jumbled one over another. Does smell delicious. Oh, I say, a bit of the old blue would liven things up. Now that you mention it, it is, it is rather hard to concentrate with it sitting right there in plain view, really. Winnie knocked again, this time so hard her knuckles ached. But the voices just babbled more loudly about blue and ripe and just a taste. Taking a deep breath, she turned the knob and pushed the door open. The tasting room was a dark, luxuriously furnished rotunda, its walls lined with cases upon cases of cheese, says. Winnie wrinkled her nose. She had never liked this room, even when it stood empty in the cold light of day. It was like a smelly Victorian man cave. At the moment, much of the smell was emanating from a table in the center of the room, on which had been laid out an alarming assortment of cheeses of all shapes and sizes, some gooing and oozing, some speckled and angry, some covered in bright red rinds that make them look embarrassed to be caught out. Around the table sat four finely dressed gentlemen, each wearing a spotless white stovepipe hat. They were all staring very hard at a wedge of blue cheese sitting just in front of Winnie's father. Well, Bull Pothy Ryan said, I suppose we could do with a bit of a nibble first. At that, all the men fell upon the cheeses like a pack like a pack of exceptionally well mannered jackals. Winnie wrinkled her nose at the sight. Each man oohed and awed over each bite, taking great pains to examine and sniff the cheese before popping it into his mouth with gusto. Mm, 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 mm. Remarkable. Winnie's father proclaimed, It's pungent, coarse, a bit veiny, but enough about your wife, Bulanga. There was a chorus of <laughs> and here, here's, as the men clapped one another on the back. Horrified, Winnie snuck a look at Lord Bulanga, but the old geezer seemed to be laughing as hard as the rest of the white hats. It's, it's true! wheezed Bulanga, sitting up straight in his wheelchair and holding up a quivering glob of gooey something or other, then triumphantly popping it into his mouth. Excuse me, Winky, when he called, but she might as well have been addressing a brick of cheddar. Her father had still not even registered her presence. He stood up abruptly and began reading from a piece of paper. A small glob of blue cheese dangled from one corner of it. All good fun, gentlemen. But we do have this school funding initiative to vote on this evening. Been sitting here for months, or so I'm told. 
Now! Winnie's father paused to take a breath and took advantage of the opportunity to insert another slice of something into his mouth. Mmm! he exclaimed, his eyebrows shooting up. Surprisingly sharp! <laughs> the, the white hat seized the opportunity to taste the cheese that had so enlivened Lord Portly Rind. Complex! Complex! mused one of the men, another crony of her father's. Langsdale, when he thought, that's his name. When they were eating, it was sometimes hard to tell them apart. I'm tasting an underflavor of plum, said Lord Bulanka with his mouth with his mouth mostly full. Gross. Winnie averted her eyes. It was enough to put a girl off cheese for life. Winnie's father waved his hands around, trying to regain control of the meeting. He cleared his throat. <coughs> <coughs> All in favor of, um, all in favor of, Lord Pothy Ryan's voice trailed off as he knitted his brows and concentrated on remembering, remembering exactly what they were supposed to be working on. Of cutting open the Rockefeller next, shout, shouted Sir Broderick, the youngest and perhaps most gladness of the group. Aye, they all shouted in unison. Lord Bulanga shouted so loudly, his hat listed to one side. <laughs> all right, all right, Lord, pa Lord Portly Ryan conceded, with little or no reluctance. But a quick reminder, gentlemen, that tomorrow is Topshaw Baby Day, and we all know what that means. To Winnie's complete and soul-rattling horror, her father began making kissing noises and blinking his eyes co co coquettishly. <laughs> That's right, he continued, his lips still grotesquely pursed. It means a performance by Madame Frou-Frou. There was a chorus of falsetto ooh la las and a burst of steam shot out of the little engine on Lord Boulanger's wheelchair. A vision, the old man shouted enthusiastically. Now there's a woman with some cheese on her bones. <laughs> Sir Broderick agreed heartily. Lord Portly Round half, half closed his eyes, held a fat piece of brie in the air, and proclaimed, A lady like Fru Fru resembles a fine piece of brie. The soft, smooth exterior, and inside, oh, the melty, milky. Winnie could not prevent a squeak of disgust from escaping her mouth. This time, her father did notice her and stopped mid-sentence to Winnie's extreme relief. Winifred! He bellowed in outrage, clutching the breeze so hard it exploded, the inside shooting out like a stream of gelatinous lava. A large blob landed directly on his hat, and his face reddened with anger. He stormed towards his daughter. It is long past your bedtime, he thundered, gesturing toward the bed. I was in bed, Winnie protested. But I saw something outside, through the window. You must all listen to me. She paused for a moment, to build up the dramatic effect a little. Then, as loudly, clearly, and importantly as she could, she made her announcement. I saw the box rolls again! Chapter 4 The response was... Well, there wasn't one. Lord Paulie Rind had already halfway forgotten about his daughter, distracted as he was by the sight of his peers tucking into another of his prized cheeses. That's nice, dear, he mumbled, licking his lips. When he stomped her foot in frustration, why must he always be this way? Why would he never listen to her? All he cared about was his precious cheese. It's not nice, when he yelled. Listen to me! I saw them, and they were right outside, and they could be coming to rip the flesh off my bones and eat my eyeballs right this very minute. No one was even looking at her. Her father's three companions were muttering and exclaiming to one another, but not about box trolls. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Quite the good, said Lord Bulanger. Would be a pity to miss this one, Polly Rind. 
added, added Sir Broderick. Token, won't you, old boy? urged Langsdale. When he thought if her father stared at that cheese any harder, his eyes were going to explode right out of his head. Yes, yes, just one moment, gentlemen. Leave some for me, he pleaded. Now, Winifred, really, a proper girl should not be upsetting over grotesque monsters. It's quite unseemly. He's really one to talk, when he thought. He still has a blob of cheese hanging off of his hat. I'm not obsessed, she argued, but they're practically inside the cheese guild, and I can't stop imagining them gnawing off my toes and stringing them together as a necklace. They do that, you know? Her father's eyes were still fixed on the cheese. A droplet of saliva glimmered in the corner of his mouth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's good, my dear, he murmured, as if in a daze. He patted Winnie on the top of her head. Winnie narrowed her eyes. Father, tell me something. If the Boxtrolls kidnapped me right now and slurred my intestines like noodles, because they do that, you know, would you give up your white hat if it was the only way to save me? Mm, y y yes, yes, dear, her father mumbled. Winnie exhaled with frustration. <sighs> you aren't listening to a word I say, she hollered as loud as she could. Her father blinked at her a few times as if he had just partially awakened from a long bout of sleepwalking. Huh? A, 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 a word. You said white hat. You, white hat! Lord Paulie Rhines' hand automatically flew up to lovingly touch his own white hat. He looked dismayed when his fingers encountered the blob of cheese. Oh my. It seems to have been smudged by a bit of brie. Uh, be a dear, Winifred, and have the butler give this a wash, would you? He passed the hat to Winnie with one hand whilst firmly pushing her out the door with the other. Winnie was practically speechless. But, but, she began. The door slammed shut in her face. Now that was really cold, even for father, Winnie thought, her disbelief slowly turning to anger. She could hear his voice happily blabbering away through the door. Back to important white hat business, he declared to a general wheezy cheer. Pass the coming, Bert! Winnie shook her head in disgust, backing away from the door and clutching his precious white hat a little too hard. Important white hat business, she mimicked, rolling her eyes. More like dumb, old man, disgusting cheese business. She stormed up the stairs and back to her room and slammed the door loudly. Not that anyone would hear it, or care if they did. In her room... Winnie stood, fuming. I am so tired, she thought, of taking a back seat of cheese. Nothing is ever going to change in this house. Father will never look twice at me unless I turn into a piece of cheese myself. Winnie clutched the white hat even tighter. Her eye fell on the set of double doors that led to a small balcony of her room. She marched over, flung the doors open, and stomped out onto the balcony, barely noticing the chill of the night air. I'll take care of your precious white hat for you, she muttered. Here, how's this? With that, Winnie flung the hat up and out as hard as she could. It sailed into the night like a disc-shaped toy, glowing eerily in the moonlight as it descended slowly, then skittered to a stop on the far side of Market Square. There! Winnie declared with satisfaction, brushing her hands together and complimenting herself on a job well done. As she stared at the place where the hat had landed, the smile faded from her face. Next to Cheese, there was nothing in the world her father and his cronies cared about more than those stupid white hats. Most everyone in Cheesebridge knew that whatever you did, and whoever you did it to, you'd best not tinker with the white hat of a white hat. All right, that may not have been the brightest thing I ever did, Winnie said. Bother! She raced back inside, making for, the for making for the main staircase. Monsters or not, she had to run out there and get that stupid hat back. She could only hope it hadn't landed in something unfortunate, like a steaming pile of horse droppings. At the excessively fortified front door, 
when he began unbolting the locks as the sound of giddy, cheese-drunk laughter echoed from the tasting room. Gingerly, Winnie opened the door just a crack and peered outside. The vast, empty market square was punctuated by the occasional small circle of lamplight. The rest lay in moon shadow, looking like an enormous lake of black ice. It was absolutely silent. At the far end of the square, a single ray of moonlight illuminated the white hat, as if she was being dared to retrieve it. Winnie gulped and took one step forward. She was now technically outside, though her hand still rested on the doorknob. I have to stop breathing so loud, she thought. She held her breath for a moment and listened, straining to hear that anything that might indicate something menacing lurking in the shadows. Somewhere off to the right, she heard something make a rustling sound like, Shaba, Shaba, Shaba. Was that one of them? You can do this, she told herself. And what was the worst that could happen? She could be torn into squishy bits by monster claws and leave no trace for the authorities save for a few bloody shreds of nightgown. But that would be better than facing father when he finds out I threw his hat into the street, Winnie thought. Stealing herself, Winnie crept down the stairs and cautiously slunk forward, as quietly and carefully as a cat. She had only taken a few steps when she heard a sharp sound, like a fork tapping another fork. Doink, doink, doink. She stopped, every muscle in her body tensing. She squinted hard in the direction of the sound. I think there's something there, whispered Winnie. I really, actually, really think there is something right over... She took a deep, shaky breath, then darted forward again, faster this time, and made a little more noise. And she heard the sound again, and froze. What on earth is that? It sounded like the skittering of leaves over a crust of snow, or the sound of claws on cobblestones. There was now no doubt in Winnie's mind. The box straws were stalking her, and judging by the different directions the sound had come from, there were lots of them, hundreds, perhaps thousands, and they had her surrounded. Winnie took off again, this time at a dead run, but the skittering, but the skittering sound followed her, and it was louder now. She spun around in a full circle, but saw nothing. Of course I don't see anything, Winnie thought. They always say in box straw busters that the monsters can disappear right in front of you. Or reappear right behind you. Winnie suddenly knew without a silver of doubt that someone, something, was standing behind her. She could feel it watching her, invisible twin rays boring into her back. I'm going to die, she whispered. Even as she said it, she caught a glimpse of the hat on the cobblestones a short way off and realized she'd gotten quite close. Maybe if she did die and they found her remains clutching the precious white hat, maybe then she would be remembered kindly. Perhaps her father would even have a small statue built. Or create an entire day for mourning her, as he had for the poor Tropshaw baby. Maybe next year, Mr. A. Resnatch would give an interview about Winifred Portly Rind mercilessly slaughtered in the flower of her youth by the Tropshaw ba baby's ravenous, blood-craving blood abductors. Gentlemen were supposed to die with their boots on. Winnie felt it only proper that she die with the hat on. The white hat. She moved forward, beginning to reach out. There was another echo of a scuttle, and then the mist lifted, and a hunched silhouette with glowing eyes came into view. <gasps> Who's there? Winnie cried. Oh, that was stupid. What two things were most often people's last words in horror stories? Hello? And who's there? Winnie might as well have signed her own death warrant. She managed one terrified squeak before pressing her hands over her mouth. Not that it mattered. The... thing had seen her. It was coming closer. 
Winnie closed her eyes tight and prepared to spill her young noble blood all over the cobblestones of Market Square. They would find her body at first light. A watchman would come grim-faced to the cheese guild door. The shrieks and wails of her devastated mother would set mothers all over town springing out of bed and clutching their children close to them. Word would begin to spread, and the streets would fill with the sobbing of women and the raging of men. The same desperate words uttered again and again. No, not Winifred, not Winifred Fortley Rind, that young, exquisite angel of a child murdered and eaten by fox trolls. Oh, no. A fat tear rolled down Winnie's cheek. It really was very tragic. After a few moments, when she was not dead yet, Winnie opened her eyes. It was standing right in front of her. But now that she could see it better, Winnie realized what she had taken for huge glowing eyes were actually two small lights fixed to either side of a pair of gold goggles. And what she had taken for the shape of a box troll was actually just an old box being worn as some sort of... fashion statement, maybe. She tilted her head to one side. Why? This wasn't a box troll at all. Who are you, boy? she asked. The boy lifted the goggles from his face and stared at her with perplexed brown eyes. I don't think I know you. Do you live here in Cheesebridge, boy? Winnie's question seemed to have stupefied him. His mouth was working furiously, but no words were coming out of it. What a strange child, Winnie thought. Why is he wandering around after dark all alone, wearing those strange goggles and a, dirty, and a dirty cardboard shirt with a picture of an egg on it? There was a sudden burst of skittering noises. When he shrieked and jumped back as something grabbed the boy's shoulder and she saw the glint of something yellow and jewel-shaped in the dark. The boy shot one look at Winnie, t at Winnie over his shoulder, then disappeared into the shadows. Taken! Taken by a box troll! Winnie could hardly believe what she had seen. Were they not going to kill him right there? Perhaps it, perhaps it was true. People said the Tropshaw baby had been dragged down to a death cave to be murdered. Hey, come back, Winnie called. It was a bad move. Winnie instantly realized. I seem to be having some issues with impulse control tonight, Winnie thought. A car horn bled, and Winnie shrieked, nearly jumping out of her skin. Twin columns of headlights suddenly sliced through the night, illuminating sections of Market Square. It must be red hats out hunting box trolls. No one else would dare drive after curfew. Thank heavens for the red hats. Maybe they would get to the boy in time. Winnie watched as the vehicle seemed to idle. Then it, then it careered forward and banked to the left. All at once, the headlights illuminated three figures at the corner of the square. It was the boy and, standing in front of him defensively, the box trolls who had snatched him. Maybe the red hats can still get him, Winnie thought. Poor boy. He must be awfully poor to be living on the street with nothing to wear but an old bit of cardboard. Why didn't I offer him money or something? When he tried it herself, although the box trolls probably would have just eaten it along with the rest of him. The red hat truck's horn bled again, and the box trolls took off with their captive, though oddly, it seemed to Winnie as if the boy was actually running with the box trolls, even appearing to help one when it stumbled. The truck raced after them, disappearing around the corner. Now the square was dark and quiet again. What a night! No one was going to believe that she had witnessed a box troll abduction. She, Winifred Portley Rind, had seen it all happen, had looked death right in the face. She, Winifred Portley Rind, had gotten closer to box trolls than any human being except the Red Hats and had lived to tell the tale, lived to bear witness to their powers of camouflage, their stealth, and their strange yellow eyes. I did think they'd be taller, Winnie thought. It, it hadn't really hit her yet, and of course not. 
she had just survived a close encounter of the troll kind. She was in shock. That's what happened to people who had terrifying brushes with death. They went into shock and you put a blanket on them. That's what I need, when he told herself. A blanket. Then I can really begin to process the horror. She just had to grab her father's hat and run like crazy for the cheese guild. But before she could take a step, a dark shadow loomed over her. A towering, ghostly shape that seemed to hiss with malevolence. The white hat clutched tightly in one of its hideous hands. Chapter 5 My, my, someone is past curfew, said the thing. Very dangerous, my child. Why, I do believe it's young Winifred Portly Rind. Winnie took a step backward and stared into the cold, glittering eyes of Archibald Snatcher. Well, I saw a... Winnie began. A what? Snatcher said, leaning forward eagerly. He really was repulsive. His skin had an unhealthy grayish sheen, and his jowls quivered like jelly under his oversized fish mouth. It was all Winnie could do not to wrinkle her nose and say, Yuck! Red hat or not, something epic had just happened to Winnie, and no one in the world knew it yet. Winnie didn't want creepy, horrid Mr. Snatcher to pepper her with questions. She didn't want to spend another minute in his company. Just a boy... When he said, uh, A lost boy. Really? sneered Snatcher. All I saw were a couple of filthy books to monsters. He surveyed Winnie with a slick, oily smile that made her feel sick to her stomach. Well, Miss Portly Rind, do allow me to escort you safely home to your esteemed father. <sighs> No, thank you, Winnie replied hastily. I can escort myself. If you'll just give me my father's hat back, I shall be on my way. Snatcher tucked the hat under one arm and began striding toward the guild. Winnie had to scramble to keep up. This was an ex this was an escort? Hmm yes. How did this hat find itself? All the way out here, I wonder, Snatcher said, smiling unpleasantly. It was, well, actually, the wind blew it right out the window, when he said, making, un making an unsuccessful grab for the hat. Snatcher licked his revolting finger and held it up in the air. Wind, you say? How peculiar. Seems to have died away. Completely, he said as they reached the front steps of the chief guild. M most peculiar indeed, when he said, mimicking Snatcher's fake friendly tone as, he sh as she made another hull lunge for the hat. He deftly moved the hat out of her reach. Well, I do thank you for the escort, Mr. Snatcher, when he said, and here we are, safely back at the cheese guild. There's no need to go inside. Winnie held her hand out for the win for the hat, and Snatcher practically smacked it away. Oh, as a gentleman, I must insist, he brayed, climbing the stairs and opening the front door. Hey, you can't just... But the reptilian Snatcher had already slithered inside. Sputtering with anger, Winnie chased after him. Hello, Lord Portly Rind! Snatcher called in a mincing, falsetto voice. I should have seen it coming, she thought. Snatcher is the biggest suck-up in all of Cheesebridge. Of course, he's not going to let a chance to integratiate himself with father get away, even it means getting me in huge trouble. Winnie raced into the front hall behind him. Will you please just give me back the hat now? She pleaded. Snatcher turned and gave her an especially ugly smile. He looked like a hideous old lizard in an oversized red hat. He whisked her father's hat behind his back and made a beeline for this main staircase. When he chased after him, 
They were halfway up when she made another grab for the hat, but Snatcher just danced around her. At the same moment, to Winnie's dismay, the door to the tasting room flew open and her father emerged. What in heaven is going on out there? he demanded. Then he caught sight of Snatcher on the staircase, and his mouth dropped open. Archibald Snatcher? Am I suffering hallucinations from an overextended strain of cheese mold? What in the world are you doing here? Snatcher managed to spin around and bowed deeply at the same time. Unfortunately for Winnie, he pulled off both without losing his balance and falling down the stairs. I should have given him a good shove, Winnie thought. My lord, said Snatcher, still doubled over in his ridiculous bow. My deepest apologies for the intrusion. But I happen to find something in the street, your lordship, that I believe belongs to you. To Winnie's utter disgust, Snatcher held the white hat aloft like it was some sort of trophy he had won after years of dedicated work. My white hat! exclaimed Lord Polly Rind, looking absolutely scandalized. Snatcher was ceremoniously descending the staircase like a princess making her grand entrance to the ball, but Lord Portly Ryan thundered up the stairs to meet him, attempting to pluck the hat from Snatcher's head, hand. I'll take that! Lord Portly Ryan snapped through gritted teeth, yanking at the hat, which Snatcher res resol resolutely refused to relinquish. Most certainly, with absolute pleasure! Such Snatcher through equally gritted teeth, still clutching on to the hat. Good grief, Winnie thought. They're like a couple of rats battling it o out over a hunk of cheese. Now, Snatcher, growled Lord Portly Rind, pulling on the hat with all his might. One doesn't acquire a white hat simply by picking it up off the... Street! Winnie's father won the tug of war and went sprawling backward into the banister, hat in hand. A white hat must be earned, he added self righteously, brushing his jacket off and drawing himself up to, to his full height. Through civic duty! shouted someone. Winnie looked down to see that the remainder of the cheese girl had gathered at the front of the stairs to observe. Quite right, all through governance, added Lord Bullanger, bouncing energetically in his wheelchair. All by being rich, exclaimed Sir Bardrick, looking around with wide-eyed self-importance. Snatcher descended the stairs and presented himself to the guild with a deep suck-up of a bow. Oh, <laughs> I don't, don't, don't I know it, esteemed sirs, Snatcher said, his voice oozing with his desire to curry favour. And I shall earn my white hat, too, when I have destroyed every last box troll in Cheesebridge. As Lord Portly Ryan came down the stairs, Snatcher began ever so casually to inch toward the tasting room, craning his neck to get a glimpse inside. Yes, well, Lord Portly Ryan said, giving Snatcher a disapproving look. Even so, there will still be one pest left among us. Snatcher stopped wiggling toward the tasting room and scowled. Now then, Snatcher, how the devil did my hat get outside for you to so conveniently find in the last pla in the first place? Snatcher, sm Snatcher smirked and pointed up to Edwinny, who was still standing on the stairs. I was told by my young friend here that the wind has something to do with it, Snatcher explained as outlandishly unlikely as that may seem. Now Winnie's father was scowling at her. <sighs> I'm sorry, father, she began, but sorry, Snatcher, Snatcher interrupted, heading for the door. Would love to stay, but must rush off. Far too much work to do. He made a great show of tipping his red hat first to Lord Polly Rind and then to Winnie. Miss Portly Rind, your lordship, esteemed sirs, I'm sure we'll be seeing each other again very, very soon, Snatcher said as he oozed out the door like a giant slug. 
Winnie's father barely gave the red hat a second glance. He was too busy glowering at his daughter. Winifred, he began. The front door flew open, and Snatcher reappeared like a persistent flea infest infestation. By the way, my hat size is six and a half. Never hurts to order ahead of time, Snatcher sang. Then he was gone before anyone could respond. Father, I was trying to say I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do it. That is, well, I sort of did in the beginning, but I think you'll see that this situation actually offers a great opportunity for a father and daughter to discuss their feelings about things that... Lord Paul Ryan rolled his eyes and made a move toward the tasting room. Wait! Winnie shouted. Listen to me. I saw something out there. A boy. A strange boy I've never seen before. In a cardboard shirt, just standing out there with box straws and... Not! Another word, Winnie's father ordered, one hand raised as though he were a traffic cop stopping cars. But father, bed, Lord Paul Ryan hollered. He swept into the tasting room, practically pursed, pursued by his three companions. The door slammed with a resounding blam. Winnie stood alone, staring at the closed door. I did see a boy, she said. And it means something, and it ought to be investigated. And if father can't see it, then he's got cheese rot on the brain. That's all. Shaking off her sadness and focusing on how right she was, and how everyone in Cheese Ridge would see it one day and be sorry, Winnie wearily climbed the stairs and walked back to her bedroom. Sighing heavily, she began to close the French doors to her balcony. But how could she go to sleep now? after everything that had happened. If her father wasn't going to investigate, someone had to. I'll go out on the balcony and have another look, when he decided. The moon was behind a cloud now, and streetlights did little to throw any light on Market Square. Winnie leaned over the railing, looking left and then right, but she couldn't see anything at all. Then, off in the distance, she heard the faint blare of a truck horn. Snatcher's men, Winnie said, drawing in her breath. The box shawls might still be out there. They haven't gone back to their death cave. Maybe that means that the boy they took is still safe. Maybe he's going to be okay. The horn blared again. Winnie rubbed her arms to soothe the sudden goosebumps that prickled her skin and sighed with the excitement of it all. Chapter 6 Eggs had never run so fast, or for so long in all his life. He wasn't sure who was having more trouble keeping up, him or Fish and Shoe. There was barely time to stop and catch a breath when the blare of the Red Hats' horn sounded again. Hark! Here comes the exterminators! howled one of the Red Hats. Eggs didn't have time to remark to Fish and Shoe how stupid it was to repeatedly tell something you were chasing that you were chasing it. It sort of defeated the purpose. They're back that way. Quick, down this alley, Eggs whispered. Quietly. The trio crept down the alley, pressed as close against the wall as they could. The voices of the Red Hat exterminators were clearly audible in the dark. Don't much like the sound of exterminators said the enormous one called Trout. For a man that size, his voice was surprisingly soft. Too negative, not heroic enough. Might give the idea that we're the villains. Huh, came Pickles' voice, which was thin and awkward like the rest of him. Well, how about something along the lines of EXTERMINATORS OF JUSTICE! But that makes it sound like we just find justice and then exterminate that, Trout grumbled. Eggs' foot brushed an old can and he paused. But the Red Hats did not seem to have heard anything. Nearby, Eggs heard the familiar sound of someone rummaging through a rubbish bin. Sparky, Pickers, Eggs hissed. It was probably them. They had been heading this way when Eggs made his Market Square detour. The rummaging stopped for a moment, just as twin headlights illuminated the length of the alley. Eggs saw Nickers climbing out of the rubbish bin with a lady's shoe in one hand. 
Sparky was hoisting himself out too, gurgling in appreciation at the shoe. Sparky! Knickers! Run! Egg shouted. Red Hat's right behind us! The box troll squealed, and the shoe went flying as Knickers and Sparky left off the bin and began to run. But the alley was a dead end. Up! yelled Eggs, pointing at a fire escape. Moments later, all five of them were on the roof, preparing to jump across a short space to the adjacent roof. Sparky and Knickers tucked themselves neatly in the, inside their boxes, making themselves more streamlined as they sailed into the air. But it had been a long time since Eggs was able to tuck himself inside his box. To his knowledge, he was the only box troll ever to outgrow his box, and no one had ever, off ever offered him a new one. Shu said something like, And Eggs obliged by grabbing hold of Shu's box as he jumped. They landed safely on the next roof with a thud. Thanks, Eggs said. On the street, there was a screech of tires on cobblestones as the Red Hats' chuck swerved around the corner into view. Gristle was driving, but simultaneously had his head stuck out the window like a dog. I'm going fast! Gristle announced triumphantly to the night. Pickles, clinging to the side of the truck, fired the net gun at something. Oh! Pickles wailed. I thought I saw one! The truck stopped so that Pickles could collect the empty net. From the rooftop, X could see that a long gutter ended within several yards of a drainage opening in the, gro in the ground that was the passage to safety. Quick! Follow me! X said. He slid down the gutter, landing neatly on the ground. As the, back, as the box troll slid down after him, one at a time, Egg sprinted to the drainage pipe. Over there! Gristle shouted. Getting us closer! Aim the neck gun! Jump! Egg said, not even waiting to repeat it. He plunged down the pipe, hearing Shu mumble something as he dove in, too. Eggs curled himself up as best he could as he half tumbled and half slid down, down the pipe, eventually landing with a wet plop in the sewer. Not the best smell, Eggs muttered. As each box troll dropped into the sewer, the small splash shot ripples of the bad smell into the air. Eggs wrinkled his nose. Well, we're safe anyway, he said. We'd better... Wait a minute! Where's fish?! Eggs and the box trolls looked around wildly. Then they heard something shouting overhead. Yes! Yes! It's in the net! We got one! But Pickles howled. No! shouted Eggs, hoisting himself up into the pipe and starting to climb toward the street. Shu and Sparky grabbed Eggs' feet, yanking him back. No! Stop! He's up there! I can get him! Eggs cried. Let me go! I have to get fish! but the box trolls had eggs firmly in their grip. They frog-marched him along the sewer until they came to one of their chutes. Gently, one of them pushed eggs into it. Not even a fat, tasty-looking grub brought direct directly to eggs' nook could tempt him. He stared blankly at his music machine, listening to one of his favorite songs. Nothing was all right. Even the music machine wasn't playing properly. The singer and band's band sounded as if they were tum being tumbled down round and round in a dryer. Shu continued to dangle the grub in front of Eggs. When he got no response, he pr he produced a gazillipede clutched in his other clawed hand. Eggs simply shook his head. With a sign of resignation, Shu popped the gazillipede into his own mouth. Why do we do this, Shu? Eggs asked. Why do we still come back here after a night like this and make ourselves go on as if not everything is normal? Shu's mouth hung open in response to that question. The Xillipede seized the opportunity to crawl out of Shu's mouth and scamper into the relative safety of the box shows' head. They drag us away and we do nothing, Eggs said, shaking his head wearily. Shu simply sat in silence. It was true, of course. Nothing could change it. The Red Hats were determined to wipe out the box trolls, and they were making better progress than ever. The permanently warped sound of the cavern clock chimed, signaling the traditional end of the box troll day and summoning all to begin assembling the sleeping pile. 
Shu got up to go, and waited for Eggs to get up too. Eggs peered out into the cave, where box trolls were beginning to stack themselves for clo- cozy sum- slumber. Then he looked around his nook. Lined up against one wall were Oil Kansas hat and Wheels' old unicycle, which had had ever, si- ever since their capture. Next to his music machine, a small bow saw lay on the ground where Fish had left it. Fish. Pig, gentle Fish. He had always been there for Eggs, looking out for him, making him laugh, teaching him to dance, helping him build his music machine, rubbing his back when he had trouble getting to sleep. Fish. Life without him seems just impossible. Pointless. Eggs picked up Fish's saw and placed it with Oil Kansas hat and Wheels' his unicycle. Go away, he told Chu. I just want to be alone. Shu wearily waddled over to ledge, where he stepped into a troll lift that whisked him toward the cavern floor. Egg sat down on the floor of his nook. What can I do? he asked himself. Fish was big and strong and kind and good, but the red hats caught him. We'll never win. We can't even fight. A corner of an album cover was sticking out from beneath the music machine. Eggs yanked it out. Tears sprang into his eyes when he realized what it was. His favorite Quattro Sabatino's record. The one fish had gotten for him when he was just a tiny box troll still dwarfed by his box. Fish. Eggs hugged the album cover to his box, then held it at arm's length, scrutinizing the four men again with their non-yellow eyes and pink furless skin, the rounded ears and the slender, clawless hands. Eggs looked down at his own undersized hands. And all at once, Eggs had an idea. The sleeping pile was already a concerto of box snores and sleep mumbles, though the light was still on. Shu, who was near the top of the pile and not yet asleep, sat bowed upright and gave a squeak of fear before cowering inside his box. The thing that had so frightened him stepped forward into the dim light. It's only me, Egg said, and I've got a plan. I've just made myself a funny striped box jacket and a hat and drawn some fur under my nose. See? I look just like one of the Quattro Sabatinos. Shu and the few other box trolls who had awakened just stared. Look, I'm going to go up there and get fish back, Eggs declared. Shu peered out of his box. Well, we don't know that, Eggs responded. Either way, I've got to do something to help. At least, I've got to try. Fish would do the same for me. You know he would. Eggs hesitated a moment. Then he sighed. He hadn't really expected anyone to volunteer to help him. Still, it would have been nice. He began to walk away, a scary, flappity feeling unfolding in his stomach. Suddenly, he stepped back into the light. Um, fellas? Do I at least sort of look like one of... them? Shu and Sparky both stared at him, then exchanged a long look. They both nodded. All right, Egg said. I mean, that's what I thought. I'll be fine. I just hope nobody asks me to sing. Eggs walked slowly, but with what he hoped looked like looked like a hero's sense of purpose toward the sucker upper, which would take him up to the above ground ramp. She watched him go and shook his head. He lifted one stubby hand and reached up to pull the string to turn on the light. But for the first time, the sleeping pile was not high enough, and Shu could not reach it. <sighs> Shu said. The box straws were vanishing. Eggs was their only hope now. Chapter 7 For a moment, Eggs thought perhaps he'd been hit by lightning. He had only just began to push the manhole cover up when a giant flash of light made him reel back, and then, with a rumbling sound, 
The manhole cover was forced shut. It must be a storm, Egg said, checking, checking his straw hat and stripy jacket to make sure his disguise was still intact. He took a moment to pull himself together. Then he gathered his strength and shoved the manhole cover up again. Clank! It instantly slammed shut again. What in the world? wondered Eggs. He tried a third time, more tentatively lifting up the manhole cover a few inches. He heard a rumble, then thwack! The holes closed again. It was like some giant hand kept coming down from the sky and shutting the lid. Wait a moment, X told himself. He tried not to talk to himself too much in the cavern, because some of the box trolls found it odd, but there was no one here to give him the yellow fish eye. Let's go over what I know. It's sleeping time for box trolls, which means it is awake time for the cheese bits. Awake time means daylight and moving around. So that explains the light and the rumbling. Eggs remembered the exterminator vehicle that red, the, red, the Red Hats had. Of course, other cheese bits had motorized wheel vehicles too. And most manholes opened in onto the street. I've got to peek and wait until there are no vehicles on the road, Eggs declared. Yes, that's right. It made him feel better to say it out loud, as though he had a clever friend with him who was coming up with smart stuff, so that Eggs only had to agree. Very cautiously, he created just a silver of space between the cover and the manhole and peered through. Two more rumbles shuddered a by, and then the and then the way looked clear. All right, now, Eggs told himself. He shoved the manhole cover to one side, scampered up onto the street, and kicked the cover back into place. Then he flung one stripy sleeve over his eyes. I'm blind, Eggs thought. The sidewalk had been to his right when he emerged. Hoping it hadn't moved, Egg stumbled in that direction. There was a dull roar all around him, the noise of countless voices talking and laughing and shouting at the same time. Something shoved him in one direction, then another. Eggs pulled his hat over his eyes to shade them. The sidewalk was literally seething with cheese bits. Was it always like this during the day? Step right up! Step right up! A voice blared from behind Eggs. Get your picture taken with the drop shop baby! A personalized and humorous keepsake for this dark and dreadful day! Get yours now! Eggs turned around and gasped. A cheese bit in a funny hat and jacket was holding up a little toy figure of a small cheese bit that had been half covered with red paint. The man was standing in front of a tremendous picture-taking machine, flanked by two of the biggest light bulbs Eggs had ever seen. Hold the chop shop, baby, for a moment! Say cheese and keep the grosser memento for life! sang the picture-taker man. Wow, Eggs thought, trying not to stare at the machine and the huge stand that held it up and the enormous light bulbs on either side of it. Imagine what we would what we could make of all those things in the box troll cavern. There was a slight poof, and both bulbs emitted a blinding flash of light. Egg staggered backward. Someone hurrying in the other direction pushed against him, and Eggs found himself swept up in the crowd, like a bit of seaweed tumbling along in a wave. He stumbled to a stop near another cheese bit who was holding a strange and colourful collection of bouncing balls on strings that seemed to float in the air all by themselves. Top Shop Baby Day merchandise right here, called the man. We got pennants, we got bookmarks, we got sunglasses, we got t-shirts. And what better way to observe this tragic theft of a bouncing baby than with a lovely bouncing balloon? Eggs, entranced by the balloons, reached up and poked at the one nearest him. It bobbed and rotated on its string, and Eggs drew back, horrified. The balloon had a grotesque, crudely drawn face of a box troll on it. All the balloons did. What's wrong with these people? Eggs wondered as he hurried away. If some, tra if some dreadful tragedy had taken place involving a small, small cheese bed named Trubchaw, or whatever it was, why did everyone look so darn happy? 
Hanging on to his hat with one hand, X pushed through the crowd until he spotted the relative safety of a lamppost. He made his way over to it and wrapped one arm around it like he'd found a long-lost relative in the crowd. Pulling himself up and out of the way, X was finally able to catch his breath. The crowd seemed to stretch in every direction. X watched the mass of people seethe and surge like a blob sharing a single consciousness. Over the blur, blur, blur of their voices, X heard something else. The sound of a single bell ringing. X searched the crowd for the, search for the source of the sound. His eyes widened and his mouth dropped. I can't be seeing what I think I'm seeing, X thought. That can't be real. Waddling through the crowd, ringing a huge handbell, was an old box troll. Hey! X called. But the crowd was too loud, and the box troll did not hear him, or pretended he did not. X jumped from the safety of the lamppost and pushed through the throng, trying to catch up to the box troll. He stopped at a large stage set up on the street. It was fronted by a wooden wall that reached the ground. The box troll pressed on a panel of the wall, which swung open like a little door. As X jumped forward, the box troll disappeared right before his eyes, but not before X got close enough to see it was actually a cheese bit wearing a box troll costume. Hey! X yelled again, but the fake box troll was gone. Curiouser and curiouser, X thought. Above ground is a very strange place. He turned to head back to the lamppost. He needed some air, and the crowd was making him feel dizzy and, dis and disoriented. But something was happening. The crowd was magically parting in front of eggs. Overhead, the sound of a musical horn rang out, and the crowd drew back even farther. At, egg at eggs's back was the stage. And, of, and ahead of him was an empty avenue created by the space of thousands of cheese bits making room. Making room for... what? Or whom? Everyone seemed to be bending over and looking hard at the ground now, as if they'd all simultaneously lost their contact lenses. This is really odd, X thought. Maybe I'd better... Before he could finish the thought, a big, burly cheesebeard darted forward and grabbed him. Hey, kid! What's the matter with you? You gotta bow down! The white hats are coming! Egg, Eggs yanked his arms free from the big cheesebeard. At the same time, he noticed he was, in fact, the only living creature present among the masses who was not bowing deeply. This doesn't seem to be a good, place, good time to call attention to myself, Eggs thought hastily mimicking the deep head-to-knees bows of the crowd. The, the horns blared again, and eggs peaked. A procession of cheese bits in impossibly white hats were marching by. The parting crowd bowed and cheered. Some of them even pretended to weep in awe. We are not worthy, cried a woman. Good morning, fine sirs, called someone. Looking very noble today, sirs, another enthusiastically exclaimed. You were all in my dreams last night, sirs, cried a, sir, cried a third. To Eggs' surprise, a very old and frail-looking cheesebit, who reminded him a little of sweets, to tottered forward toward the marching white hats. Lord Portly Ryan, sir! Please! The factory was condemned and I lost me job! Lost me home! Have no food! We need your help! Please, sir! The one called Lord Portly Ryan, a large red-haired man, red man in an immaculate uniform covered with shiny pins and metals glanced at the old cheese bit. How simply dreadful, Lord Paul Ryan said without missing a step. Certainly. You shall have help, my good fellow. Someone get that man a bit of cheddar. A servant closely trailing Lord Paul Ryan nodded and presented a small cube of cheddar to the old man. Thank you, sir. I... Wait. That's it? This is all I get, the old man exclaimed, staring in disbelief at the little square of cheese in his hands. But the white hats had already swept past. A mouthful of cheese isn't going to help that man, Eggs muttered. Already, another bedraggled-looking man had jumped forward. Your lordship! 
The city sewers are overflowing and the streets are crumbling. My old granny tripped on a pothole and broke, and broke her hip. And oh, sirs, where is the children's hospital you promised us last year on Tropshaw Baby Day? Lord Paulie Ryan made a swatting gesture at the man as if he were a housefly. Good people, he called in his thundering voice. Much as we'd love to assist and placate each and every one of you with cheese, I must remind you that this is not a day for business or complaints. Today is a day of remembrance. A day when we look back on our town's darkest hour. A day when, I say, a day when... Oh, kill the music! On command, a burst of music erupted. It seemed to Eggs' ringing ears to be coming from every direct direction at once. Lord Portly Ryan seemed to be scanning the crowd, crowd looking for someone. Instinctively, Eggs shrank lower into his bow. He isn't looking for me. He can't be, Eggs told himself firmly. I'm in disguise. I'm the fifth Sabatino brother. I am the fifth Sabatino brother. As Eggs worked on hypnotizing himself, a chorus of oohs and oh my's and ooh la la's rang out. Ah! There she is now, boomed Lord Paulie Rind. Make way for the lovely Madame Frou-Frou. To the stage, my good people. To the stage. The crowd surged obligingly, coming together and pushing toward the stage. Where Eggs was still standing, someone pointed. Look at the curtain. Someone's pushed a megaphone through, a voice shouted. Eggs turned to look at what everyone else was looking at. A long funnel had appeared where two sections of curtains meet, center stage. A sing-song yet somewhat familiar voice came out of it. Ladies and gents, children of all ages, from Krakow, Slovakia, a town destroyed by box shows, so don't bother looking for it. Our guest, who's been through it all but is here to enthrall, that's right, She's gone through perdition, and now she's dishing. Yes, sirree. From a ravaged land, she shall tell you first hand. The curtain shifted slightly, and Eggs got a glimpse of the hand holding the megaphone. It was a big, hairy hand with lumpy knuckles, and the oversized wrist was straining inside a tiny, lacy sleeve. That's bizarre, Eggs mumbled. And so, my good people, the voice continued, without any further ado, I give you the divine Madame Frifre. The crowd went wild, hollering and clapping and stamping their feet on the cobblestones. The curtains parted, and a very large, elaborately coiffed woman in a luxuriously appointed full-length gown stepped forward, blowing kisses at the giddy crowd with her heavy painted lips. My thanks, the woman cried in a husky, loud voice. Thank you, thank you. Behind her, off to one side, the white hats had gathered and were bowing and blushing and making reverend little gestures at the woman. Looking even lovelier than usual today, my dear Fru Fru, Lord Pauly Ryan said. He was blocking Lord Boulanger's view and the old man tried to scoot his wheelchair out front. But Lord Pauly Ryan aimed a discreet kick and diverted the chair's trajectory. He lunged forward to grab Madame Fru Fru's hand. Oh, Lord Pauly Ryan, you old so so. You are too much. <laughs> Madame Fru Fru said with a girlish giggle amplified by an unexpected rumble of baritone that made her fleshy jowls quiver. Or maybe you're just too much. <gasps> Madame Fru Fru attempted to retrieve her hand, but Lord Pauly Ryan was hanging on her for dear life. Finally, after more giggling and wiggling, the lady playfully smacked Lord Portly Ryan in the nose with her fan. Momentarily startled, he let go of her hand, and Madame Fru Fru hurried down stage with resounding loud footsteps. My dear people of Cheesebridge, it is so good of you to come and hear my sad, sad tale. Of course, you all know how the vicious box troll. Beasts 
devoured my poor Cracker Slovakia, leaving me a woman without a home. Oh, the infamy! Those villains consume my native town break by break and baby by baby. As good I is my witness, those bombshells ate it all! Boo! roared the crowd. Villains! Monsters! Revenge! Eggs went pale, shrinking back, shrinking back from the sheer hatred in the voices of the townspeople. This is crazy, he thought. A box show and had a fly. Well, except to eat it. Anyone in their right mind can see that the real monsters are the creeps in hats. Red hats and white. They're all horrible. And now I can do nothing but travel the world, warning other towns to beware the monsters, so that they do not share my poor Krakoslovakia's fate. Because, mark my words, they will return. Madame Frou-Frou concluded, wiping what must have been an ex excessively small tear from her eye with a giant lacy handkerchief. The crowd cheered now. Egg stared at them dismally, wondering how so many people could have fallen victim to such a great pack of lies. He caught a glimpse of a pale-faced young girl with red hair, and he did a double take. I know that girl, Eggs thought. Then he reprimanded himself. Don't be silly, Eggs. You're a box troll. You don't know any girls. No, no, quiet down, people. Madame Frou-Frou commanded shrilly, For it is now time for join the story. Cheesebridge has its own bitter taste of tragedy at the teeth of the box trolls, has it not? And that is why we are here today, to recount the sad story of the Tropso baby abduction. No, we can't. It's too painful. But if we must, hooray! come a jumble of voices. But first, as most of you know, I work with my audience, not for them. I require a helper for amongst you. Do I have a volunteer? A small throng of well-dressed G-Spit children shoved their way to the front of the crowd, all of them shouting. Ace could see that the girl with the red hair had raised her hand high and was now leaping and waving in an attempt to make herself seen. Now, the rule is you must put your hand in the air and I don't see any hands, Madame Frufru Madame Fru -Fru scolded the children. My hand was up, shouted the red-haired girl. That means I'm the volunteer. Without waiting for Madame Frufru to answer, the red-haired girl climbed up on the stage and stood next to her, gazing out over the crowd. Egg's mouth dropped open. He suddenly realized why she looked familiar. It was the cheese bitch girl from Market Square, the girl he'd come face to face with the night before, the girl who had called after him, the one who had called Eggs a name he'd never been called before in his life, a strange name that felt like his own box, familiar but the wrong, Size. Boy. Chapter 8 From his position very close to the front of the stage, Eggs could hear the red-haired girl talking as Madame Frou-Frou tied a bonnet around her head and attempted to stick a pacifier in her mouth. Did you hear me? I said I saw a boy with some box trolls. Don't you think you should tell the audience that by down, Miss Portly Ride, Madame Frou-Frou commanded, pushing the pacifier into the girl's mouth. Ish, Winnie, the girl corrected. Madame Frou-Frou shrugged. Either way, stick to the script, girl, she commanded with a rumbling hint of threat in her voice. Music, please. Eggs watched in growing disbelief as Madame Frou-Frou embarked on a grotesque song and dance number. Oh, not too long ago, and not too far away, the little drop-shot child was happily at play, 
she began. Someone jumped onto the stage and roared. Eggs recognized him as one of the red hats dressed in a ridiculous costume that was supposed to pass for a box troll suit. Roar! The red hat yelled, advancing on Winnie, who was pretending to be sleeping like a baby. Oh, please, Eggs thought. He covered his face with his hands, but could not block out the blare of Madame Frufrus's voice or the words of her repulsive song. Up came a monster, a man-eating beast. He stole that poor boy for a late-night feast. With ten-inch talons, with blood-soaked teeth, it took that poor baby to its caves underneath. The crowd booed and hissed, and some of them shouted, Look out, baby Chopshaw! Help! Father, save me! called a different voice. It was the girl. Eggs opened his eyes and almost lunged forward. But there she was still on stage, being pushed toward a trap door by the costumed red hat. She isn't in danger, thought Eggs. She's... she's... she's acting. I thought they were supposed to be commemorating a tragedy. How repulsive. As the girl slipped through the trap door and disappeared from view, an awkwardly tall and gangly red hat came on stage, howling like a distraught father. Madame Frufru pointed a heavily jeweled hand at him. The poor father woke. Oh, he cried, cried, cried. Oh, cause he forgot to lock his babe inside. Tell him, Mr. Pickles, someone cheered, clapping. Pickles dropped to his knees on stage, howling like a tone-deaf coyote auditioning for Cheesebridge Idol. No! Trapshaw baby, no! You are my only child, and I'm so distraught and confused by fear that I have staggered out into the street searching under every rock for you, forgetting that I now render myself vulnerable to the vicious beasts! Behind you! shouted someone. It's that brute Gristle being a box troll! Look out! Madame Frufru stepped forward and raised her hefty arms in the air. The sun went down, but father kept on looking, so the box stopped around him to do some more cooking, she droned. Gristle pounced on Pickles and dragged him toward the trap door, launching him into it with one well-aimed kick to the behind. Just when Eggs thought the spectacle could not get any worse or more offensive, Gristle began prancing around, rubbing his stomach and drooling, as if he were preparing for a raw and bloody meal. The audience bellowed its disapproval, and Madame Frufru drew herself up to her full height so her singing could be heard over the roar. They baked father and son of a fiery pit, and iced their eyeballs for a banana split. They pickled their tongs and jerky their skin, and distilled all the blood into bathtub gin. Gristle yanked open the trap door, reached in, and pulled out a bunch of extremely fake-looking bones, which he crammed into his mouth. Yum! 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 He said. Egg stamped his foot. Box trolls are bagatarians, you idiot! Egg shouted, letting his temper get the better of him. And nobody actually says nom 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 when they eat! Fortunately for Eggs... There was far too much noise for him to be gone, to be heard. Oh, Shrow be gone! Madame Frufru bellowed, rushing at Gristle and beating him over the head with her fan. Ow, ow! Gristle protested. You are hurting my feelings! He lay down and covered his head with his hands, and Madame Frufru climbed on top of him, forcing a faint ooh sound to escape his lips. So, fellows, lock your doors, and gals, lock your gate. Please heed my warning before it's too late. Fathers, hide your mothers, and mothers, hide your kid. Or you all, all of you end up just like that drop shop baby did. The crowd went wild, cheering and, un and roaring. Bravo, they called. Encore! I've got to get out of here. Eggs told himself, I think I'm going to be sick. It made no sense to go toward the, the, toward the crowd. Whilst everyone was busy clapping and hollering for the bowing Madame Frufru, 
Eggs carefully made his way around the stage, emerging with relief on a vacant patch of street behind it. The situation was much worse than he thought. Eggs realized. These cheese bits are all suffering from delusions, he said to himself. I don't think there's anything I can do to help anyone. I ought to just go home. Out of the corner of his eye, Eggs saw movement. A small door at the back of the stage structure opened, and the red-haired girl who called herself Winnie emerged, brushing off her clothing. Eggs tried to make himself as small and unnoticeable as possible. Winnie didn't look as if she'd noticed him. She headed off down the street, and after a moment, when it seemed no one else was going to show up, Eggs decided to follow her. Winnie examined her reflection, taking a long time to fix and then refix her hair. Yes, there he was again. Winnie could clearly see the striped jacket reflected in the mirror. He is following me, Winnie thought. But why? Is he one of my father's minions? Or merely a pickpocket? Trying to act as casual as possible, Winnie began walking again, humming to herself and looking each store window and at each stand she passed. When she saw a stall displaying brightly colored ribbons and necklaces, she stopped and pretended to examine the merchandise. Ooh, soft, she said out loud, fingering one of the ribbons. And such colors! Almost good enough to eat! She heard a rustle and glanced under lowered eyelids to one side, where a figure in a badly made striped jacket was also now touching the ribbons. To her astonishment, he pulled one of the ribbons toward his mouth, tried to take a bite of it, then spat it back onto the table. What a weirdo. Winnie ha hastened away. He was no minion. All her father's lackeys were far too well bred to behave such so rudely. He must be a street thief. But as fast as Winnie walked, the footsteps kept pace up with her. Maybe I can't outrun him, she thought. But if he knew he was stalking the daughter of a white hat, he'd probably trip over his own feet trying to escape. She rounded a corner, then doubled back and stepped boldly onto the sidewalk, stopping right in front of her surprised follower. Aha! When he shouted triumphantly, Caught you! What are you doing? Why are you following me? The thief looked around wildly, caught sight of an old bear resting against the building, and dove inside it. Uh... Hello? I saw you go in there, when he said. And unless that thing has a false bottom, you're not getting away. What is your deal anyway? You are the worst pickpocket I've ever seen. And what's with the Ringo Sabatino outfit? He just stared her from the barrel, his hand drooping down over one eye. <sighs> Whatever. Suit yourself, when he said, tossing a coin into the barrel. Here. Get yourself a copy of, picking, of pickpocketing for weirdos. She walked away, trying to swallow her disappointment. Whenever it seemed like something exciting might be happening to her, it always ended up being stupid. Uh, when he heard, uh, who? She picked around. She turned around. The pickpocket had climbed out of the barrel and was trying to say something. English. When he, said, when he said loudly, I only speak English. I saw you. I saw you last night. When he froze. Truth be told, that sounded very unsettling. Unless... Unless he meant I saw you and then they took fish, he added. When he took several steps forward and pulled off his hat. Hey, wait a moment, she said. Yes, you were the one with the box shows last night. Egg's intuition intuitively took a step back. Every single cheese bit he encountered considered the box shows to be mad, bad and dangerous to know. But when he was just standing there, her head cocked to one side, an expression curious. Yes. Egg said. I knew it! Winnie exclaimed excitedly. I knew it! 
No one would believe me. I can't believe he got away. I'm so relieved. I wanted to help, but no one would, else would listen to me. How did you escape? We went on the ground, I said, but they got fish. They, they, they dragged you down to their death cave? When he asked her eyes huge, huh? I blinked in confusion. Were there mountains of baby bones and rivers of blood? Oh, d don't answer that. You must be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. You could be in shock. You need a blanket. Uh, anyhow, it was probably pitch black except for the glow of the cook fire. So, did they eat your family? M my family's... Did they make you watch? Did you hear bone snapping? I'm tougher than I look. Tell me everything! When he pleaded. What is wrong with this person? X thought, freaking out and practically in tears with frustration. Is she just like the rest of them? How could how can anyone get a cheese bit's attention? Seized with a sudden impulse, X grabbed Winnie's arm, lifted it to his mouth, and bit it. Ow! Winnie yelled. You bit me! I need to find the men with the red hats, X said loudly. You bit me! With your mouth! Where do I find the men with the red hats? Eggs demanded. When he t looked taken aback, I... Wait, you mean the box troll exterminators? They're a bunch of coarsely bred louts. Why would you want to bother with them? Where are they? Eggs cried. When he put her hands up. All right, relax. Sheesh. The red hats all live on Kurd's Way. See that street there? That's Milk Street. Just stay on it for a long time. Eventually, it turns into Kurt. Eggs looked up at the street sign, then nodded. He, p he brushed past Winnie and took off down Mil Milk Street. Then he stopped and turned around. That stuff isn't true, you know, he said. It's ridiculous. And we do not eat babies. Then he raced away as Winnie stared after him. What's not true? She called. And how did you... Did you say we? Did you just say we don't eat babies? Eggs did not even slow down. None of this makes sense, Winnie thought. There's something up with that kid. And why is he dressed that way? And why did he eat a ribbon and dive into a barrel? And why does he talk like he... Like he knows the box strolls? Without bothering to mull it over any further... Winnie picked up her skirts and ran after the boy as fast as she could. Chapter 9 There was nothing there but a big old run-down building. Eggs looked around. Well, what did you expect? He asked himself. That the Red Hats would all just be standing here waiting for you to find them? Of course, the girl might have been lying. She was a cheese bit after all, and that's what cheese bits did. But there's something about her, Eggs thought. She doesn't seem like the others. Not exactly. Then Eggs heard something, just for a fraction of a moment. He spun around and saw nothing. No one. But his heart was suddenly beating a mile a minute. It might just have been his imagination kicking into overdrive. But Eggs didn't think so. He knew that sound too well. That definitely sounded like a box troll, he said, nodding. And not just any old box troll voice. It sounded very much like a box troll who had just dropped something on his foot or bonked his head. It was the sound of a box troll saying a thing that meant, Ouch! It had to have come from that building, X said. There's nothing else around. A sign over the door was weathered and warped and difficult to read. But Eggs could make out the word, Factory. The door itself at one time had had something painted on it. Eggs squinted at the peeling, rust-colored outline, then realized what the painting had been. A red hat. Clearly, this was the place. Near the door, a stack of empty wooden crates lay in jum a jumble on the ground. Eggs crept over and grabbed one, then another, expertly creating steps and a platform onto which he could climb. The windows were smeared with filth, but a small crescent had been broken out of one. An egg peered through it. At first, he eyes could not, his eyes could not make out anything in the darkness, but he, but he heard voices. I'm poking it with a stick, Mr. Pickles, someone, sh someone said. Hey, you! I am poking you with a stick! 
Don't waste your breath, Mr. Gristle. He doesn't speak English. Now, Mr. Chat, do you ever get to wonder what they are thinking about? Oh, I imagine they're evaluating their life choices, Mr. Pickles, came the reply. Right you may be, Trout, pondering as how they chose to be dirty, disgusting monsters instead of fine, upstanding heroes such as ourselves. You are all wrong, came another voice from deeper within the factory. Eggs ducked, then raised himself up a little. He heard the sound of footsteps echoing off the factory walls. M Mr. Snatcher, we wasn't expecting you. Eggs pressed one eye to the little hole in the glass. He could see the red-hat boss now, striding onto what seemed to be a large chamber full of boxes. Listen and learn, Snatcher said. A box troll cannot choose a lifestyle, because a box troll does not aspire to be anything more than a weak flesh-eating pest! Now, a man, on the other hand, can and should choose to choose his own life. Our dreams are in our grasp. We should grasp them, snatch them, claim our dreams, our destiny, and shove it down everyone else's throats! There was a brief silence. Throat! Gristle repeated. Fine words, fine words, Mr. Snatcher. I dare say that's why you're the boss, Pickles mumbled. I should say so. Snatcher growled. So, you will all agree, gentlemen, that the best way to walk in the shoes of those we aspire to be is to emulate them. Mr. Pickles, fetch the shoes, asked Pickles, his voice overlapping with Trout's suggestion. Clogs? There was a brief pause. Bat, suggested Gristle. Eggs' eyes had adjusted well enough to see that Gristle was swinging something in the air as Pickles and Trout ducked. No! The cheese! Snatcher's voice thundered. The crate Eggs was standing on shifted slightly. He jumped to the ground, rearranged the crates, and climbed up them again. Now he could see Snatcher in his red hat sitting down at a long table. Each of them held what looked like an old paper airplane in his hand. Ready then? Gentlemen, don your white hats. At Snatcher's command, the men lifted their hands to their heads, whisked off their red hats, and placed the white paper things on their heads like, a, like cheap lopsided crowns. Are you sure about this, boss? asked Pickles. It feels wrong. Maybe we've all had one too many slices of cheese, and you know what that does to you, know what I mean? Snatcher slammed his fist onto the table so hard that even Eggs jumped a little. Unless you are referring to the unifying power of cheese and its ability to unite respectful men in brotherhood, I most certainly do not know what you mean, he barked. N nope, me neither, but, but what you said, that's what I meant, Pickles mumbled. Then let us begin, Snatcher said grandly. Eggs watched curiously as Trout opened a small wrapped bundle, his, head, his hands trembling. He broke off a morsel of the bundle's contents and put it on the plate. It was a tiny orange bit that looked like a cheddar cheese. What are they doing? Eggs wondered. Trout put three smaller pieces of orange on the three remaining plates and lined them up. Then he pushed on the table until it slowly began to turn, like a giant, like a giant spool. After a great deal of creaking and groaning from both the table and trout, the table revolved just far enough to, de to deposit a plate in front of each man. Eggs watched as Snatcher ceremoniously lifted a piece of cheese to his lips, reverently closed his eyes, then placed it on his tongue. He emitted little sounds of delight as he chewed. It seemed to go on forever. Eggs had never seen anyone take so long to eat one bite of anything. Aromatic, yes. Or has a hint of oak. And an undertone of a mother's smile on a warm spring day. Why, this cheese is positively uh, big words, tummy banter, uh, very fine indeed. Um, you've got something, 
Pickles pointed at Snatcher's face. Even from Egg's vantage point at the window, he could see large red blotches breaking out all over Snatcher's skin. He's got the cheese fits, Pickles whispered loudly to Trout. Fetch the leeches. Snatcher looked around. His face was beginning to swell, too. His lips looked like little sausages, and his eyes had become mere slits. Where is... where is he going? Snatcher snapped. More cheese? Oh, boss, I don't think you should... Pickles began. But Snatcher already forced another piece of cheese into his rapidly swelling mouth. He must be allergic, Egg said to himself. This is probably a good time for me to have a look around in here, while they're all distracted. Over the window, a large tunnel-shaped air duct was bolted to the building, leading up and then through the wall. Eggs had no difficulty scampering up the inside of it, as it wasn't all that different from some of the small chutes in the Bokshaw cavern. When the air duct leveled out, the air became stale and dank. He could hear muffled raised voices. I was born I was born through eating cheese, Snatcher was shouting. I belong with the cheese in it. Uh, you're not wrong about that, boss, came Pickle's voice. Uh, spot on, Eggs tried to agree. Inching forward, Eggs could see dim light ahead. Wriggling on his stomach, he maneuvered himself to the edge of the air duct. The large, decrepit factory room spread out below him. But there was something hanging in the air. Some sort of crate or elevator that was blocking Eggs' view. What is that? he wondered, scooting forward a little more and squinting to focus his eyes. Then he gasped audibly. The object hanging in the air was not a crate, but a cage. And there was something inside the cage. Someone! A sweetly lumpy head and doggedly pointed ears that made Eggs think of... It was fish! Without a second thought, Eggs launched himself through the air and grasped a chain that went from floor to ceiling. He clung there silently, praying none of the red hats happened to look up. I belong in the tasting room on velvet pillows, sampling the finest cheeses, and all the people bowing down to me and admiring my white hat. Now, no, don't get yourself all worked up, Trout advised. Use your breathing, Pickles advised. Carefully, Egg shimmed, in, shimmed down the chain and dropped quietly onto a crate in a shadowy corner. He peeked into the room and saw Snatcher climbing onto the wooden table, while Trout held up a jar of black wriggling leeches. If you'd just lend me your face for a moment, boss, Trout said, Shame, shame, bad piss. You dare lay a finger on your king. And I should be king, and would be king, if not for the scoundrel bully ride. From the crate, Eggs had an even better view of fish in his cage. While Snatch continued to vent, and the Red Hats continued to agree with every word he said, Eggs crept cautiously to the cage, grabbed hold of the bars, and hoisted himself up, making sure to keep on the side of the cage not visible to the Red Hats. Fish, he whispered. The box troll turned, and for a moment, Eggs thought he'd made a mistake, that this box troll, with its lifeless, hazy yellow eyes, was not his old friend. But then Fish recognized Eggs, and his eyes grew wide. Ah! Fish exclaimed. Eggs shushed him. Fish instantly dove into his box. The, the momentum caused the cage to begin to rotate slowly on its chain. For the always said, if you work hard, you'll get a white hat, Snatcher bellowed. And what did he get? Nothing! As for me, I've worked my hump off for size for this stupid town, waiting for the rubbish, got so charging some wrongs. What has that red poorly ruined if you done but gobble off cheese and ruin the government? You better hurry up and get those leeches on him before we lose him, Pickles muttered. Eggs reached down and unlocked the cage that catched to the door of the duck of the cage. Hearing the sound, Fish peeped out of his box. All right, follow me and hurry, Eggs whispered. Taking Fish by the hand, Eggs leapt from the cage down to the crate, pulling Fish with him. 
straw! Snatcher's voice thundered, and X froze, his heart hammering. Stop the wall from spinning! Snatcher was staggering around on the table, which had begun to spin. Come on down from there, boss, Pickle said. Just take it easy. Everything is going to be fine. Trout, I command to give you that bag of cheeks, she, Snatcher said, stumbling backward and plummeting off the table. He hit the floor with a tremendous crash. He's cheese drunk, Eggs whispered to Fish. Maybe be some kind of a allergic reaction, too. Listen, Fish, we've got to get back up there to that air duct. Quickly, while they're too mad to notice. Snatcher was continuing to shout and bray like an enraged donkey as Pickles and Trout slowly inched toward him with a bottle of leeches. Egg saw Pickles lunch. Got him! Pickles yelled. Do it now, Trout! Do it now! I'm putting leeches on your face! Gristle cried triumphantly. Fish just, fish just didn't seem to able to do anything. So Eggs hoisted him in onto his own back and began shimmying up a pipe that led to the ceiling. At the top, Eggs was able to get himself and fish onto a wide rafter that led to within feet of the air duct they, they needed to crawl through to escape. There were strange grunts and sucking sounds coming from below. Eggs snuck a look to see that the leeches were sucking the swelling right out of Snatches' face, then dropping to the floor, engorged and squirming. Oh, that feels better, I said. Uh, what are we about to do? Uh, we, we was gonna open the factory floor and put that new box stall to work, Trout said. Quite right, Snatcher agreed. Open the factory floor! Pickles pushed a huge lever, lever, lever and, a hu and a large section of the floor began to open, revealing a dark pit below. We've got to go, Eggs whispered urgently. From the rafter, he propelled himself and fish onto the, st onto the hanging cage, and from there, gathering all his strength and combining it with the momentum of the swinging cage, he managed to toss fish into the air duct. Eggs then stretched himself toward the duct. He had one foot on the edge of the duct and one foot still on the cage when he happened to look down. Retrieve the new box troll! Snatcher commanded. There was a series of gasps and exclamations. Gone! Where? How? Fish made an urgent sound for Eggs to get his other leg into the air duct so they could escape. But Eggs was paralyzed, staring down, hardly able to believe his eyes. Once the factory floor was rolled back, it revealed a dark pit full of machines and blurry shapes. Suddenly, one of the shapes at the end of a chain came into focus. Oil can! X cried with wild disbelief. You're alive! Chapter 10 There was a sudden babbling of excited voices, and X realized that at the end of every chain there was a box troll. Books! Sparky! Knickers! The air filled with the sound of box trolls calling out to him. And then another voice was added to the mix. A deep, hoarse, and distinctly unboxtrolian voice. Eggs? Above his friends, Eggs saw a strange creature hanging upside down from one of the chains. He was very furry like a box troll, but he had small pink ears and clawless hands like a cheese bit. Some of his face was pink too, but the rest was covered by thatches of long fur on, to on top of his head and around his mouth. Look! Up there! Snatcher shouted. Eggs looked down and realized with dismay that Snatcher was pointing right at him. Snatcher was staring intently at Eggs' face. His eyes narrowed. What the? It can't be. No. It's not possible! Snatcher exclaimed. Why, why yes! He's got a box troll! Oi, you! Give it back! Pickles called to Eggs. Snatcher gave Pickles a vicious shove. Don't just stand there! Go and get him! Confuse him! Frighten him! Gristle took off running while Stroud ran to the levers in the factory floor. He gave one lever a yank and the cage on which Eggs still had, still had one of his feet jerked up into the air. Eggs, glim Eggs glimpsed fish tumbling out of, the si out of sight into the air duct. 
Trout slammed the lever the other way, and the cage, with eggs, plummeted to the floor as the floor continued to close over the pit. Eggs barely had time to lodge himself through the air and onto a rafter. You! Snatcher bellowed. Ten years and now you show up! Beneath him, the precious upturned faces of his box troll friends disappeared as the floor closed over the pit. Why are you doing this? Eggs hollered. Box trolls don't hurt anyone! You've no right! You've got to let them go! Because I need them! Snatcher declared. Those box trolls are my ticket to a white hat! Pickles and Gristle were running back and forth, trying to sort out a plan to attack on Eggs. Pickles fumbled with the net gun, and Gristle leapt into the nearest hanging cage. Going up, Trout! Gristle yelled. Trout nodded and threw another lever. The cage smoothly ascended to the rafters, and Gristle jumped onto, the, onto one. He was just feet from Eggs now, surveying him and grinning wide-eyed. He held his bat in one hand. Batter up! The gristle sang. Egg scrambled across the rafter. Down below, Pickles was aiming the net gun directly at him. Shoot him! Shoot him, Pickles! Snatcher bawled. I'm trying! Hey, you! Could you stop moving for a minute? Pickles called. Eggs began to backtrack, but he found Gristle blocking his way. An ugly smile on his face. Gristle raised his bat at the same time Pickles aimed the gun and began to squeeze the trigger. I'm not going to let you kill the box trolls, X called defiantly. I'm not going to let you hurt my friends. I think you're all evil. Well, I don't care what you think, Snatcher snapped. You're not even supposed to be alive. The plan was to kill the Tropshaw baby. Tropshaw? Baby? Everyone began looking around for the source of the new voice. Egg saw her first, standing in the open doorway of the factory. Winnie stared up at Eggs, a half-smile on her face. Maybe he did have a chance of getting out of this after all. I knew there was something strange about you, she called. My intuition is very good. Did you even... Winnie's voice fell away when she became aware of the Red Hats. Gristle still held his bat high in the air, ready to smash eggs to a pulp, and Pickles was still pointing the neck gun. Oh dear, uh, have I interrupted something? I did knock, you know, when he said, narrowing her eyes. Why, my dear Miss Pauly Rind, Snatcher said nervously, uh, does your father, by any chance, know that you're here? Of course not, when he said, but I can't wait to tell, to see the look on his face when I tell him I found the Tropshaw baby, alive and well. Eggs looked down at the mass of box trolls. Was there a baby in there too? How dreadful. Snatcher sighed wearily. <sighs> Gentlemen, Caesar. Before, Ex Before Winnie realized what was happening, she was surrounded by red hats. Sorry about this, miss, Trout grumbled as he grabbed her. Unhand me, sir, Winnie shrieked. Sadly, the how will learn that the box trolls claimed another victim, another innocent victim today, so she said. That would be you. Eggs heard the sharp blam of a neck gun being fired. He ducked, and a ball of net flew past him. Eggs grabbed a chain, dodged Gristle and his bat, and swung down the factory floor. Trout was holding Winnie in front of him like a shield, but Eggs' feet slammed into his shoulders, and the red hat went tumbling. Quick, to the door! Eggs cried, pulling her along. Outside in the sunlight, Winnie stopped to catch her breath and stared at Eggs. What exactly have you gotten me into? She asked. No time! Run! Eggs ordered. There was a crash as Gristle burst through a window, and moments later, Snatcher, Pickles, and Trout came running on out the foot at the door. In one direction, there was block after block of another, of nothing, and in the other direction was the Red Hat's exterminator truck. Come on! X cried. They ran to the truck and dove inside. Now what? asked Winnie. X stared at her. He hadn't thought that far ahead. Try pushing that! Or that, or try turning that key. Winnie did as he said, and suddenly the engine roared to life. 
The truck took off so fast, Eggs almost went flying out of his seat. Sorry, when he said, gripping the wheel, her eyes huge. I'm a pampered 11-year-old girl. I don't drive much. They careered around the side of the building, where Egg saw a familiar box. Wait, he cried. He opened the door and called urgently. Fish! Over here! The box suddenly grew a head, arms and legs. Fish did not need to be told a second time. He jumped into the truck and Winnie floored, floored it. Now what? Winnie asked again. Here, wedge the gas pedal down with my shoe, Egg told her. As soon as this truck arounds, rounds the corner of the factory, we'll jump out. The Red Hats will be running toward the truck, and we could get away. It worked like a charm. As Winnie, Eggs, and Fish tore away from the truck, it continued to hurtle toward the front of the factory, where the shouting Red Hats were waiting. The ruse only b bought them a few minutes, but by the time Eggs could hear Snatcher's voice barking and braying on the street, they were in the manhole and he was pulling the lid closed. Where are they? Eggs heard Snatcher yell. He must have come to a stop almost directly over the manhole. Did we lose him? Pickles asked. That don't make that don't make no sense. That'd be evil prevailing over good. You idiots! Snatcher snapped. If Lord Paulie Ryan's found finds out the Buttershaw boy is alive, it will ruin everything I have worked so hard for. Uh, quite right. Everything we have worked for, Trout added. That's what I said, Snatcher said. Everything I worked for. Uh, you said I again, Trout mumbled. Oh, it's all the same thing, Trout, objected Prickles. You know, I don't think it is, Trout countered. Stop your quibbling, Snatcher said. We have work to do. But they, but they, but they got away, Trout pointed out. It's over. From the other side of the manhole, Eggs could practically feel Snatcher glaring at Trout. Over, he said. Over? Utter nonsense. It ain't over. It ain't, it ain't even over till the fat lady sings. It is time, gentlemen, to call Madame Frou-Frou. Call her? Pickles asked. But I thought she was really just something you... Oh, I see. Quite right. Very clever, boss. Yes, but who is calling her? We or I? Pressed Trout. Eggs heard the sound of muttering and a brief scuffle and the unmistakable sound of a boot connecting very hard with the red hats behind. <laughs>